Dun 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 dun. Welcome to Mormon Scoops. Dun 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 dun. With your Mormon Scoops anchor, John Dillon. Dun 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 dun. And your other Mormon Scoops co-anchor, Kara Burrell. Dun 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 dun. Hi everyone, welcome to Mormon Scoops. The date is February fifteenth, twenty twenty two, and we are bringing you some hot tea and toast. Is I just wish I could rename the program because the church might be toast and we're here to bring you the tea. So if you have questions on your mind, like what is the pervasiveness of the Mormon faith crisis right now within LDS stakes and boards? What is the rise of the conservative fundamentalists, the Trumpsters, the preppers, the QAnon, the Anavaxers, and what is going on with how women feel in the church? Are they staying? Are they leaving? Um, what's the attempt to involve more women in the church? Post-COVID apathy, we all know it. We are all here because of it. So we're going to talk about that. Talk about the Pimo Mormons, the ones that are physically in, mentally out, and the decline of Mormon youth programs that have seen a dramatic decrease in Mormon church service. That's how we have some, some tea to share. We really, really do. So, uh, and also if you're wondering, what's up with all those temples that President Nelson is announcing? Are they really going to be built? What's going on with the temple department? Are they actually in chaos or is everything running according to plan because the church is led by prophets, seers, and revelators? We're going to get into all of that tonight on this episode of Mormon Scoops, taking live call-ins at the end of the program. John, why don't you go ahead and tell us how people are going to call in and what that's going to look like? Wow, that was a wonderful intro. Nice job, Kara Burrell. Uh, hi, I'm John, and it's so fun to have you here for Mormon Scoops. And uh, yeah, yeah, we tried something last week where we would take call-ins, video call-ins, and we're going to do that towards the middle of the show once we kind of do our normal presentation. So what we'll do is we'll share uh, the link to join kind of midway through the show. If you're on a desktop, Chrome browser is your best bet. Uh, make sure you enable, whether on your mobile phone or your desktop, both the camera and the microphone. And we'll take some callers uh, mid-show on video. How does that sound? It sounds great. And also, don't forget about Super Chats. We're going to announce them at the top of the show. It's a great way that you want to support my purchase of more Red Bull and having this type of energetic start <laughs> to the show. Um, Super Chat is a great way to donate to the podcast. There is a, link, a little symbol with a dollar sign at the bottom of YouTube. Press that. Send us a couple bucks, and we'll try to highlight your comment on the show. I mean, I think it's a legitimate question. Do we want Kara to have more Red Bull? I mean, is that, do we want that? Do we not want that? It's fair. Yeah. Only because we did such a bomb episode today with Margie. I was making me a little bit quiet and have inner solitude. Now I'm ready to break out of that. And we're ready to, like I said, spill some tea right now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Spill nope. some Red Bull. <laughs> and we have some super, super important announcements that we're going to save to the end of the show. So please stay to the very end for those announcements. All Your right. life will be changed. You'll should, be grateful that you did. Absolutely. So should we get going? Let's do it. All right. So um, what we want to do with uh, with Mormon Scoops is start with kind of a few stories that are in the news. And uh, the, the first story that's in the news that we think is super important, kind of important, uh, many of you will remember uh, that uh, Brad Wilcox had a bit of a moment last week. We kind of had Mormon uh, Brad, Brad Wilcox week on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, we stumbled on a pretty fun, amazing TikTok uh, that was a response to the Brad Wilcox video. And in our sort of short in the news section, we thought we would highlight uh, this video. So here it is, everybody. Good. How come the blacks didn't get the priesthood until 1978? What's up with that, Brother Wilcox? What, Brigham Young was a jerk? A jerk. Members of the church were prejudiced? Maybe we're asking the wrong question. What is it? Maybe instead of saying, why did the blacks have to wait until 1978? Mm -hmm. Maybe what we should be asking is, why did the whites okay. and Why? other races have to Why? wait until I'm sorry. Negative. So you could either watch our three and a half hour Mormon Stories episode, or you could just watch that 30 second TikTok. And it's, that gives you everything you need to know. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important to mention, okay. uh, yeah, I think okay. it's important to mention kind of who, who these people are. So check out the Black Menaces. That is their name on TikTok. Subscribe to their channel. It looks like it might be uh, African American BYU students that have their own TikTok channel. So I could be wrong about that. I don't think I am, 
but uh shout out to the black menaces for a really fun uh response to yeah. the brad wilcox video okay uh next thing in the news is uh as you all know uh we covered brad wilcox and his presentation to the alpine uh tri-state fireside last week caused quite a stir uh deseret uh salt lake tribune and others have covered that that uh brad wilcox apologized twice he apologized first on uh facebook and then uh later in a fireside that went on in Canada, Brad Wilcox apologized there as well. And uh, we just thought it would be fun to play a quick little clip of Brad's apology. How and, many of uh, you watched that entire fireside to see what was going to happen? I sure did. They got us. They <laughs> yeah. tricked us. Yeah. I listened to the whole thing and all I got was this lousy apology. Just kidding. No, but I mean, it was, it was good. it's really right. interesting to see. We, You know, clearly they knew that the, world would be watching because why would Brad apologize just to this random Canada staker area, you know, when it's a global apology. So it really was a staged global apology um, that Brad, you know, I'm sure he would have coordinated with church headquarters. I think he said that um, elder Christopherson was kind of outside the room. Uh, we don't know, but if it's true that it was sort of a staged coordinated apology, uh, it was interesting that he had his wife kind of in the background there. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play the apology really quick. And, nice to see uh, you, Debbie. Nice to put a face with the Facebook comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I just thought this little comment in the Trib article, it says, Corbett, a Black Latter-day Saint, was present for Sunday's event. So for whatever reason, they felt like it'd be really important to have an African-American or a Black Latter-day Saint join the apology and he actually makes an appearance. I thought it was interesting, Kara, that he makes brother Corbett makes um, an appearance during the apology. And uh, we can talk about whether that was coordinated or not, but here is the apology. Uh, now this has been a hard week for me. We're going to be speaking tonight about trusting in the Lord. And this has been one of those weeks when I have needed to trust in the Lord. Some of you may have heard about a talk I gave last Sunday night. Now, it wasn't the first time that I've given that talk, and it wasn't the first time I've used the ideas I shared or the line of reasoning that I used to try to address some difficult topics. In the past, I failed to see how my comments could be seen as insensitive and hurtful. And I'm very grateful for friends, friends like Brother Corbett, who have helped me and corrected me and taught me. Once again, I apologize. And I'm grateful more than ever for the atonement of Jesus Christ, which allows us to trust in the Lord. What do you think, Kara? What do you think of that announcement? Um, uh, what did he say that this talk is about trusting in the Lord more? And you got to think for a guy who said that same speech so many times as we have come to understand that he was probably trusting in the Lord and trusting in the spirit all of the times that he gave that talk then. And it's only when it was publicized and out that he realized that he may be, what do you, what did you realize, Brad? Did you realize maybe you shouldn't trust in the Lord more or do you have to trust in the Lord more now? because you're being called out for being one of his servants. I don't understand what he means by trusting in the Lord more now than ever. Do you? No, I mean, that was the theme of, of the entire episode or of the entire fireside. And it was interesting. What that, is having saying racist things for like years and years? <laughs> what, how does that have to do with trusting in the Lord is my question though. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that was just the theme of the fireside and um, he used it. He kind of invoked that theme during his apology. That's That's the way I understood it. I just thought it was interesting. Well, it was interesting that they brought on a, an African American or a Black Latter Day Saint, and that they actually showed his photo during the apology. I don't know if that was planned. Um, I, I guess one question I still have remaining is: What about apologies to Christians? What about apologies to atheists or people who leave the church? Yeah. What about apologies to women? Like it, it was if you know the, the race issue was kind of the only one they were super concerned about. And then they kind of brought on Brother Corbett to kind of, I don't know, help make that better as a part of the apology. Mm -hmm. And then 
And then it was nice that that Brad passed the mic to Brother Corbett. Yeah. To give the majority of the presentation. Um, yeah, we'll get props or props so, or earned. Yeah. The thing that's still not sitting well with me, you guys can tell me what's not sitting well with you still, is uh, this type of rhetoric around people who leave the church. And I met with a friend today at lunch, and she realized after her husband had a faith crisis, and she was still taking the kids to church with her non-believing husband, she realized, my kids are going to learn things at church that's going to make their, them love their dad less. And everybody has a mixed faith family at some point. Not every single Latter-day Saint family has 100% belief in the church and just this type of rhetoric that pits one family member against another that they are less than just still really really bothers me and it's kind of just this really unfortunate sword that's utilized against people instead of a christian church that builds people up and unifies people it's saying we've got it you don't and that is just the most toxic rhetoric that i i really wish that the church would disavow that especially you got the race piece but what about everything else yeah. so it really really doesn't sit well with me I was, I uh, had a phone call with some friends who live in the Alpine stake. And this is, uh, I was, I thought it was interesting that this is on the hearts and minds of housewives and husbands and youth all over Alpine, which is kind of ground, ground zero in many ways for Mormon church wealth and influence. Senator Mike Lee lives in Alpine. Uh, Gerald Lund, you know, who wrote the work in the glory lives in Alpine. Like so many prominent and wealthy and powerful Mormons live in the house in the Alpine Highland area. It turns out that some of these parents were mad at us, Kara. I don't know if you know this or if you know Ooh. why, but basically, you know, we called out the fact that where were the adults? Why weren't the adults outraged who were in the audience? Why didn't they speak up and protest? It turns out the adults were asked to stay home and that only youth were allowed in the audience or or the majority of youth. Now, to the church to be to be fair to the church. Uh, the reason why they did that is is because they wanted to have as many youth there as possible. So they asked the adults to stay home. Um, that's fine. But if you're going to be teaching things that could be potentially very problematic to parents, I think the rules of informed consent would kind of require that parents be allowed to attend and encouraged to attend with their children especially if things are going to be said that are so problematic. Yeah. Just ending this idea that if it's taught by a church leader, if it's coming from somebody at church headquarters, that it's, it's okay. And it should be okay with parents. Parents deserve to know what their kids are being taught at church instead of being told to stay home. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that the church will have to uh, keep working on and good job, Brad Wilcox for the apology. Good job, Mormon church for encouraging the apology. It's still begging the question. If, if, it, if an apology is good enough for Brad, why isn't an apology good enough for Russell M. Nelson, for Don H. Oaks, Jeffrey R. Holland, and others? Why are they requiring apologies of kind of their mid-level management, mm -hmm. but not uh, offering apologies? Like, should Elder Holland have apologized for his musket talk at BYU? These are questions that kind of remain. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll deal with those in future episodes of Mormon Scoops. Yeah. Um, keep talking about it, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah. So another... Uh, um, another sort of piece in the news. Kara, do you want to read this? This is just, we love ex-Mormon Reddit. This is just a little screenshot I took from ex-Mormon Reddit. Apparently, Brad Wilcox showed up at a religion class at BYU-Idaho today to say hi. Kara, why don't you go ahead and read what uh, Hein Tokal writes on the ex-Mormon Reddit. Be careful reading out Redditors' names, John, on live air. We might get banned off YouTube. Some of them are a little bit sketchy. Okay. Brad Wilcox showed up at my religion class at BYU-I today to say hi. He came to recruit for SFY. FSY, for it, strength, strength of, of youth. youth. It's yeah. like the new ch the church's new uh, EFY program. Memorable quotes include, girls, we need ya. Boys, we need ya more. Oops. <laughs> Apparently, they need more male leaders than women to volunteer. Additionally, Brad admitted, it's been a hard week. To which the teacher replied, we're with ya. Talk about damage control. He's hiding in his home base of CES and still going about his business as usual. Didn't address the atrocities he preached from the pulpit countless rhymes times, times or apologize. Nobody said anything e either. Just a reminder to me that nothing will change and I need to get out of the school ASAP. Ooh. Well, we appreciate ex-Mormon Reddit. It plays a really important role in uh, Mormonism and post-Mormonism. And uh, again, it's systems, not people. Brad Wilcox, what's his wife's name again? Uh, Debbie. Debbie, we love you Debbie guys. With an I. We're not out for you. We're out. You just are the messengers 
uh, representing the church and representing Mormonism. Uh, so uh, we wish you and your family well. We hope you guys have better weeks. And uh, mo most importantly, Mormon Church, we hope you learn to listen to these uh, episodes to get feedback to make substantive, meaningful changes because we don't get joy out of uh, all this pain and suffering. At mm -hmm. least I don't. Um, I would rather you say the nothing that's ever racist or sexist or makes anyone feel small or undeserving of their creator's love ever again. And then just cut that out and we'll be good. And the show will go away. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll be happy. Okay. Next uh, bit of news that I thought was interesting. Salt Lake Tribune reporting uh, that the LDS church made $22 billion during the pandemic. And... Uh, uh, you know, a couple little quotes from this article that I thought were inter interesting. It says the fund remains heavy with technology stocks dominated by what is now a $10.3 billion stake spread among Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. Apple is still Ensign Peak's single largest holding at $2.9 billion, followed closely by Microsoft at $2.8 billion. And then it goes on to say documents show that Ensign's managers bought 118,380 additional shares in Tesla last quarter, upping their position from 462 million to 755 million in the U.S. electric vehicle and clean energy firm. So, Kara, what do you think about Apple and Tesla being at the centerpiece of Ensign Peak's investment strategy? Um, you know, like that scripture that's like a child will lead them. It's like gay and atheist billionaires will lead them. <laughs> They're all just like in one club together. So yeah, as long as the church uh, keeps investing in stock and keeps like, yeah, following this rising tide, they don't even need tithing at this point. That's at, at a long, long time ago, they didn't need tithing, but. And you're of course referring to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple being um, an, um, an open gay man and uh, Elon Musk. We assume Elon Musk is probably atheist or agnostic. He's the CEO of Tesla. Do you even know? Have you heard about Elon Musk at all? Do you know? Um, to name his child what he named his child, <laughs> you have to believe there's no God or no consequences. <laughs> That's good. All right. Um, shout said, out to Elon. Let's tag Elon in our Twitter account or something. See, play this clip. And... He would love that. <laughs> he just needed an ego stroke. He doesn't need Kara to even know who he is. Anyway. One more piece of news, uh, and then we'll get into the main event for today's episode. Really important um, breaking news today. There's a, a podcast called Questions from the Closet. Uh, it's basically Charlie Bird and Ben Shalati. Both are BYU employees. Charlie Bird, of course, uh, is, I think he's been Cosmo, kind of a dancer, um, kind of gay Mormon celebrity at BYU. Cosmo is the BYU mascot. And I was not surprised when he came out of the closet because he's a professional person who just like impersonates a kitty cat for a living. So right. I was like, oh, gay, huh? Interesting. Sounds right. Yeah. Hope and he's living his best life. Is he? I think he is. I, for sure he is. And we're about to hear about that. And then Ben Shalati, I think he works for the Honor Code office as well. And these are two openly gay men, again, that work for BYU. Well... We did an episode on Mormon Stories podcast uh, a few months ago, maybe, with Gerardo Sumano and uh, one other uh, Mormon Stories listener. And in that episode, we talked about how the Mormon Church has this history of kind of using uh, gay celebrities or gay spokespeople to kind of push for celibacy in the Mormon Church, for mixed orientation marriages, for faithful gay discipleship within the Mormon Church. And uh, we weren't going after Ben and Charlie, but we did mention Ben and Charlie as some of the most recent examples. We had heard uh, through multiple sources that that Ben and or Charlie were actively dating other men mm -hmm. while they were BYU students and or BYU employees, and that that was kind of a the, one of the worst kept secrets in Provo. And uh, whether or not they actually were dating, that wasn't our point to speculate. It was only to say that if they were able to date, and specifically if they were able to date because they were kind of celebrities and had special privileges or permissions from their bishop or special arrangements with the honor code officer, whatever, that that uh, wouldn't be quite fair. Because on the podcast, they were basically telling gay Latter-day Saints, be celibate, get a mixed orientation marriages, live the like law it's, of chastity. Like it's working for us? 
What they, they're saying it was working for them, or what was their yeah they, they, from their experience that's the they way were, to go. They were creating the appearance, as I understand it, they were creating the appearance that they were celibate, living the honor code, um, that sort of thing, and encouraging other gay Latter Day Saints to be celibate or get in mixed orientation marriages and live the honor code. Um, and so we basically posed the question: If it's true that you're secretly dating, but telling other gay Latter Day Saints um, that they they should be celibate, live the honor, live the law of chastity, or get um, mixed orientation married, that that would be kind of unethical. And if they had special deals with their bishops, that would also be unethical. And what it turns out, and this was announced today on this podcast, Charlie comes out. Uh, it turns out as um, being in a romantic uh, relationship with another man. And he, this is him. This isn't me outing him. This is him coming out on his podcast, telling his audience, to his credit, um, I have been deceiving you and others. I have been um, engaged in what he called same-sex romantic behavior. He calls it SSRB with another man. Why, I've been sinning and not living the honor code while a BYU student and while running a podcast telling other gay Latter-day Saints to uh, obey the honor code and live the law of chastity. Wow. And so to his credit, he admitted that he's been doing this. Wow. And he's still a student. But he also told the audience how he's dealt with that. And basically, and this is this is sort of our advice to gay BYU students and lesbian students everywhere. What he did is... Uh, he, I think he got word that people were starting to talk. So he went to the honor code office and confessed. And because he didn't get caught, but instead because he confessed, they were lenient on him. And now that he's backed off um, and promised not to engage in same-sex romantic behavior um, while he's a student, and I think he graduates SSRB. this. SSRB. SSRB. While he... Um, remains a student through the spring, he says he's going to not engage in SSRB with his boyfriend. Um, they're going to let him stay. And so this wow. is kind of interesting on so many levels, because if you are a gay or lesbian BYU student, and you think that you're going to get caught engaging in same-sex romantic behavior or violating the honor code, Charlie's given us the playbook. Go consider if this is right for you, going proactively to the honor code office, confessing to them that you have not been faithful to the honor code, tell them that Charlie Bird did the same thing. He's currently a BYU student and that the church didn't kick him out. And so they can't kick you out. Yeah. And get then, that, get the word out on the street. <laughs> yeah. Get that word out. And then uh, if they're in any way consistent, they will be lenient to you, let you stay. And then just, um, you know, don't get in trouble. This is like the Mormon Supreme Court, where it's like the ruling on the honor yeah, code it office of Charlie precedent. Bird. It's establishing precedent. So, May I refer to Charlie Bird and then just use that since it worked for I him? Mean, honestly, I guess. honestly, the, it couldn't hurt. I guess the stakes are high, so I yeah. don't mean to be flipping about this. BYU students do what's safe and right for you, but you should at least know for sure if you get caught and you're in trouble, make sure you tell your bishop and the honor code office, you know about Charlie Bird, you know that leniency was given to him, don't let them ever kick you out of BYU because if what's good enough for Charlie Bird should be good enough for the rest of the gay uh, and lesbian Latter-day Saints at BYU. I think so. And again, wow. shout out, kudos to Charlie and Ben for admitting this, for being public about it. Uh, maybe this is a brand new day for LGBT BYU students. Maybe they're going to be... Um, allowed to date now as long as they stay in touch with the honor code office and um, don't get caught doing something bad. I wonder if we were to ask him though, that do you think it's mentally, is it healthy to completely just not engage in any type of romantic behavior to the person that you're attracted to for your four or longer years at BYU? Is that not only is it, is it sustainable, but is it healthy? I wonder what he would say. Yeah. I mean, I know in my dissertation research, uh, being choosing to be celibate was the worst choice you could make for your mental health and well-being. Um, so I think science has told us the answer to that. Gay, straight, whatever it is, you're worthy of love. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. 
And that, that may not be true for everyone. There may be asexual people out there or others that. But are you worthy of it? Damn straight. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that is our kind of in the news spotlight. It is now time for our, uh, our main event. Da, 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 da. Top story. <laughs> yeah, we are for the main substance of tonight's show. The question that we're asking is, is the Mormon church in decline and insider report? And let me just give a little background or a few disclaimers. First of all, you know, um, w- one of the one of the most uh, significant comments that I receive or questions that I receive constantly, I don't know if this is true for you, Kara, it's sort of like, do the brethren really believe or are they intentionally deceiving everyone? That's question one that I get. They, people ask that like as if John DeLynn is like <laughs> sitting in like a I sleepover. Them, like, hey, like, Dallin, like, guys, it's true or dare. Do you guys really believe in their legs are like kicking in the background? They're like, popping popcorn and stuff like on a big like cute bed or something that's how i think everyone imagines like john tell us painting each other's toenails yeah (laughs) i'm like they don't talk i don't know why you think john would know no he can do his best guess yeah well that's what that's question one do the brethren really believe or are they fooling us but question two is is the mormon church in decline and um i want to kind of give a proper i want to set proper expectations so the question you all are asking, the reason why we have 1,200 people currently joined into this live episode, which we're we're super happy about. You know, you all want to know, is the canary dead? Is the canary in the coal mine dead? Or is the canary still alive? And I want to set your expectations to say that when the, more, you know, now that the Mormon church is worth, you know, if it's not worth a trillion dollars now in, in cash and stock and bonds and real estate, and assets and intellectual property, it will be within the next 10 to 20 years. It's it's minimally worth three to four hundred billion dollars, and it's gonna be worth a trillion within a decade or two if they're not already there. So um, as long as the church is that rich, there's gonna be a, a ton of members that don't leave just because they don't want to lose their jobs, or they have contracts with the church, or their church employees, like federal government employees, or they're you know, direct family members to top leaders in the church, all of which have intense pressure not to leave. So, you know, I'm just going to set your expectations. If if the if the shakers who actually have a doctrine that you shouldn't have children, if somehow they're still alive 100 or 150 years later from when they started and they're not allowed to have children, somehow they're still alive, the Mormon church is going to you know, be alive for probably centuries to come. Sorry if that disappoints some of you, but that's just reality. And so I will, of course, reference. We were spilling Mark other tea, Twain. and now the tea I just want to know is about the Shakers. I want to know everything about the Shakers. No, it's true. They have a doctrine that says don't have kids. How do they ha- have intercourse or represent? Oh, By I thought Congress. like it's like only have them on accident. Take your wife and shake her. <laughs> Ooh, that's dark. <laughs> um, no, no, no. They, so they have to get converts who are willing to take that vow. And, but, but I mean, how many, how, how, that's, that's that for a missionary door approach. <laughs> knock, knock, knock. Would you like to join our plan of salvation, which includes never having sex for the rest of your life? No sex either? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you can have sex and not have kids. I don't know. I'll tell I you guess. about it someday, John. Okay, tell me about that. All right. Anyway, uh, so, you know, the, the Mark Twain quote uh, comes to mind. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. You know, the Mormon church isn't going to go away anytime soon. And I'm not going to claim right now that we have some huge, massive bombshells uh, for tonight's episode. But I do think, I do think that you are going to find, uh, dear watcher, viewer, listener, some really interesting things on tonight's episode. And to let you know kind of what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'll tell you how this uh, episode came about. So uh, there is a social media platform um, for business people, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. So I got this email from LinkedIn. That's like, John, you haven't visited LinkedIn and LinkedIn in like 10 years. Uh, there's, there's messages waiting for you. So I, I sign on to LinkedIn and I go through my messages and I have like 500 messages that I haven't answered in LinkedIn. I'm embarrassed to admit that. And one of them was from, um, a guy who lives, let's just say somewhere along the Wasatch front, Somewhere between, let's just say, Southern Salt Lake County and, let's say, Southern Utah County. So somewhere along that little corridor, morador, as they call it. They're all the same at the end of the day. (laughs) 
there's probably a little bit of difference between like Riverton or, or like, um, you know, Murray and like, let's say Spanish Fork. I don't know. No, you think they're all the same? In terms of like most of the people on your block are Mormon. I'm talking about densely populated Mormon area. Daybreak people, you tell us if you're different than uh, Nephi people. You tell us. Or are you all the same? Anyway, we're off track. Fight so. for second place because we know Provo's <laughs> number one. All right, go for it. Oh, you're a Provo girl. I'm a Provo girl through and through. The blonde hair, not tell you already. Go on. All right. So as I'm talking to this guy on LinkedIn, he makes a really interesting comment. He says, John... You might find it interesting to know I'm an avid listener of Mormon stories. I've been listening for 10 years. I lost my faith like 10 years ago, but I've stayed in the church because I've wanted to, you know, it's good for my family. My wife still believes and I want to be a positive influence on the inside. And he says, I'm on the stake high council and I have access to all the stats and the data from my stake. And he said, I've done an informal survey of, you know, priesthood leaders in my stake and I found that 30 to 40% of the um, members of our stake are not literal believers. They are non-literal believers. What? That's what he said. And we're going to get into that. But that like piqued my interest. Because this is a person who's doing interviews and talks to other people I mean, in the he, same he position. He travels throughout his stake, gives, gives presentations and speeches to stake members. And... Um, and he also sits on high council, stake high council meetings, and he, you know, is in stake priesthood leadership meetings. And, you know, but but that's not a huge surprise. We have many Mormon bishops, active Mormon bishops, active Mormon stake presidents, active seminary and institute teachers who no longer believe, yeah. but they remain in their positions either because they have to uh, for job reasons or family reasons or because they want to. So it's not a total surprise, but it's always fun to find out about. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised? Uh, yeah, I actually am that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next. Anyway. So, so this guy's telling me, uh, this, and so we meet for lunch and he gives me the skinny of insider information, anecdotal and statistical about his stake. Also about area because he attends, he attends area level trainings. I don't know if it's Utah area South or whatever, but he attends general authority level trainings from his area. And he has a few well-placed contacts within church headquarters that have given him scoops. So today, scoops. Mormon scoops. Yeah, yeah. So today we're going to share with you what uh, he shared with me. And before we jump in, I just want to give a shout out to inside sources. Like the no November 2015 policy leak, that came about because of an insider in a bishopric or stake president, stake high council, who leaked that information to me and others. Uh, you know, a huge shout out to, um, you know, this person who, well, let's say just the, the member of the Alpine stake, actually there are a couple members of the Alpine stake or stakes who sent me, you know, sent us that, uh, Brad Wilcox talk from last week. If we had not received those leaks, we would not have been able to, uh, share with you Brad Wilcox and week on Mormon Hero Stories podcast. <laughs> exactly. And huge shout out to this guy. And I just want to say, if you... Uh, are aware of insider information within your stake or ward. If you have interesting speakers coming to your ward or stake, please record that stuff. If you have troubling one-on-one -on -one, uh, or one-on a few interviews with general authorities or bishops or stake presidents, and it's legal in your state or country to do this, please leak to us so that we can make sure that sunlight is an amazing disinfectant to help the Mormon church become healthier. Cause that's what we want to do at the end of the day. And we don't want to thrust people into faith crises no. whatsoever, no. but we are here for you. If some of this information is devastating and on the other end, you need to find a place to go in a community to, and a new life to build outside of this church. That's got, like we were saying with the Brad Wilcox talk, so much toxic rhetoric that is not helpful. does not facilitate a good Christ-like relationship with your fellow family members, the yeah. world in general. So there's some toxic things in this world. And yeah, if we can shine a little light on it and make people really evaluate the church that they belong to and what the membership is for and what they're not, then we'll hear for you. So thanks everyone. Yeah. And given the stakes of Mormonism, Top this stakes. practice of like secret insider info and speaking to the insiders one way and then speaking to the public another way, that's got to go. So, all right. So without any further ado, I'm going to, we're going to share with you guys some intel from a mid-level Mormon church leader along the Wasatch Front with contacts at LDS Church headquarters, a person that I'm affectionately referring to as 
Mormon scoops deep throat. So he summarized five challenges that are pulling at his stake, all the stakes that he's aware of in kind of the Utah South area, I believe it's called. He, he categorized it as five things, youth apathy, COVID apathy, right wing cognitive dissonance in the church, LGBTQ plus issues, people under 30 ish just don't have a problem uh, with LGBTQ issues and testimony issues. So that Kara is kind of a preview for what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, that's how he summarized it. And I'm just going to dive in with the first, and this is going to be verbatim text that he wrote me. Um, we're going to start out with some anecdotal stuff and then he drops into actual data. So regarding uh, faith crisis and testimony stuff, this is what he writes. Do you want to read it, Kara? Yeah. Okay. Um, my this brain cells say, Kara, it's your time to go. Move your lips. Okay. Mormon store or Mormon. So this is him writing me is, and you're reading. I'm okay. reading it in my woman voice though. This is not a woman. This is a stake. High councilman. High councilman. On the Wasatch front. Which would be a man. Yeah. <laughs> Talk deeply. I'd say it comes up in every leadership session of every state conference and frequently in high council meeting. Our state president has noted that this is a frequent topic of discussion in coordinating councils, meetings with 20-ish state presidents in our area. So again, it's not like this problem is going away, but it does feel like it isn't as common as it was three to five years ago. One member of our state presidency read the Oaks talk where he said, don't study if you have church history issues. Okay. So what he's saying here, as I understand it, is that faith crisis issues are the topic of the day, that there is not a single meeting that happens on the stake level where faith crisis issues isn't mentioned. That's kind of significant. Um, yeah. But he's saying that Faith crisis issues for historical or theological or doctrinal reasons, the types of things that would cause liberals to kind of leave the church, maybe isn't quite as prevalent as something we're going to talk about in just a second. Any responses to that, Kara? Any it makes reactions? me think of when the electricity goes out in your house and the only thing that you can talk about is like, that's so weird. I'd be doing so much. There's the only topic of conversation is how the lights are off and you can't really move on with your life until you get the lights back on. But as we are going to tell you, I don't think the lights are going to come back on. I don't think you guys will be able to talk about much else. Well, hopefully they'll change, but you know, we'll see. It's yeah. just people in faith crisis and that's the topic of the day. That's all that they can really talk about, yeah. it feels like. And that's... Part of the problem for them, if I'm in their shoes, is that the more you talk about it, the more you create the problem. So because if you're talking to all your top leadership constantly about, it's like porn. The more you tell Mormon kids not to look at porn, the more they're going to look at porn because you keep talking about it and reminding them and making it forbidden. The more you talk to your top stake leadership about faith crises, you're probably going to start some. What if we can combine porn with the gospel topics essays and make like a really sexy, like, <laughs> do you want to learn about Joseph's polygamy, Kirtland in Ohio, and then make it irresistible to Mormons? Faith crisis and porn. Anyone want to sponsor me on that project? I'm saying no, but you know, <laughs> you could do that on, uh, my on your own channel. All right. I'll make it an irresistible. <laughs> okay. So that's point one. Um, let's go to point two. Go ahead and read the title because he wrote these titles as well. Cognitive dissonance and angst among conservatives for the first time. Okay, this is important. This may be the defining issue right now. Multiple people in our stake have left the church slash distanced themselves from the church and or are openly critical for the first time because of the church's stance on vaccines and masks. Feel the church is too liberal. Multiple people in our stake have either left spouses or are in turmoil with spouses because of the prepper movement slash Julie Rowe stuff. Yeah, and this is kind of this is kind of a I you know, he's going to tell us later this is the defining issue. Can you imagine one of your stake presidency members in a Mormon stake presidency posting anti-vax uh anti-mask kind of trumpian messages uh on his Facebook page, you know, and the whole stake starts watching. Can you imagine that you're having like a wave within wards and stakes? following Julie Rowe, prepper Julie Rowe. Uh -huh. We know that like Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, who ended up killing their own children, uh, they are Julie Rowe. They were Julie Rowe fans. They were Julie Rowe friends. We did a whole episode or a series on the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow murders, basically, or alleged murders. And so to think that Julie Rowe, who we've also covered our Mormon story, she like is prophesying about the end times. She's choosing dates, 
you know, when the second coming of Jesus is going to happen, she's encouraging all these preppers to like buy tents and, and ammunition and guns and go up to the hills and sell their 401ks and their life savings because the end of the end of the world is nigh. Like this is a bigger problem as big as the faith crisis, you know, liberal truth claims, CES letter type issues are for the church along the Wasatch front. It's he's saying it's a way bigger issue. Julie Rowe, prepper, anti-vax Trump rhetoric. It's tearing marriages apart, families, and top church leaders are resigning over this issue. Did you mm -hmm. have, you're from that area. I'm, Did you have yeah. an idea that that was happening? All I can say is that I was raised by people that are, I wouldn't say quite preppers, but I was raised by people and my family is plugged into a certain kind of like more spiritual, hippie, conservative underground community that's been around for years. And they'd have like small little gatherings and like, you know, rent a cabin up at Bear Lake kind of stuff. So I've always known that there was like this underground quiet thing because that's what my family members were kind of in. Um, but it is interesting that COVID has taken a rise where people have to pick a side now more than ever. And the only thing that I really care about in my deep foundation is somebody is waking up and realizing maybe the person I put my faith in the prophet is not what he claims to be. And so the reasons for that, I might not agree with, but still the other side of that life shattering faith crisis is still who I have a heart for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So did I know about all of this stuff? Yeah. I went to the book of Mormon evidence conference. Like I brought up like a thousand times and that is very much that crowd too. Do you yeah. know what I mean by that? Yeah. Like, like people who have their own kind of off brand of Mormonism where they sustain the leaders, but they still think that they have a certain connection with truth that the leadership does not access that they do. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in just a second because the church has an answer for that. But I'll just add to what you're saying, Kara. The church is really being split in two because they have liberals and progressives and pro-LGBT people and pro-women and, and pro-people uh, of color on the one hand that's pulling the church in one direction. And then you've got these prepper fundamentalist super conservatives pulling the church in another direction. And it's got to be an excruciating task to try and stay centered and not lose both wings. So um, let's go to uh, the next slide. This can this continues the conservative uh, sort of commentary. Kara, do you want to continue? Cognitive dissonance and angst among conservatives for the first time. Uh, part, two. part two. I can't stress enough how big of a deal this has become. Well, we had a high ranking leader in our stake released because he was too pro Trump on social media and believed in the QAnon stuff as well. The combination of anti vaxxers, Julie Rowe-ites, preppers, and insane conspiracy theories, plus the church's relative moderation on those issues, has caused real schisms in wards and quite a bit of radicalism in wards among some. Yeah. So this is just repeating kind of what we just talked about. Anything else you want to, I mean, the, the QAnon stuff is also significant because the QAnon conspiracy theory, it, it really reminds me of like Ezra Tap Benson, no man knows my history, John Birch society, conservatism that, um, you know, that, that we brought on Matt Harris on Mormon stories podcast to talk about during the kind of sixties and seventies, Ezra Tap Benson kind of years and QAnon just falls right along with that. But the fact that QAnon has kind of infected, you know, Mormon wards and stakes throughout the Wasatch Front. It's a little bit of the chickens coming home to roost because if, if the Mormon Church doesn't encourage critical thinking, if the Mormon Church doesn't encourage people yeah. to value evidence, if the if the Mormon Church kind of relies on emotion as a way to discern truth, then then yeah, you're going to have a lot of people who uh, are devoutly religious in, incorporate sympathies towards you know, movements like QAnon into their worldview, and it's going to infect the church. People who sometimes don't know how to decipher real types of data, analyze things um, versus just go off of what feels best and stick yeah. with that and, you know, everything else be damned because their feelings trump all. No pun intended. Yeah, in some sense, religion can be viewed as a, as a conspiracy theory. And so what is, how, how different is QAnon from a, a set of religious beliefs, believing in something you can't totally see, but you can read the tea leaves and and, and feel the spirit and, and know it's true. Yeah. yeah. And just to be clear, I don't think anyone who, I think people get into certain ideas that we all want the best for ourselves, our family, our countries. 
and we have disagreements about how to best analyze the data of what actually will have that come to fruition. And so people who are in all of those different camps that we just explained, I truly believe I was very conservative, grew up like in an anti-vax family. My parents have Trump painted on every car. <laughs> like I grew up in the most version of that. My parents had never heard of QAnon though. So don't tell them about that one. But <laughs> Um, we're interviewing Rod Meldrum on Friday, like the young, like the Heartland theory, universal model, all of these things that are just not really based in evidence. I was raised in that and I still have a love for these people. And I believe that they're, they're genuine good people who are looking for how to, you know, get out the truth to try to better society, better people that they think they have the answer. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that they do, but we all want to believe that people are doing the best with the information that they have, that they're not, they don't have nefarious motives. Yeah. Yeah. And we want... We, we don't want Mormon stories to be partisan, Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, liberal politically. I believe there are good reasons to be in either party or independent. We have John Larson on who clearly takes one side, but we want our Republican or conservative listeners to feel like our show is safe for them. So just that's to be as explicit as possible. We may have our personal biases, but we want to, we want you to feel comfortable on Mormon stories podcast. For sure. Okay, a third uh, slide that that relates to conservatives, Kara, and this is going to be a little bit repetitive, but he's just really emphasizing um, and, and giving a little bit more detail. All right, part three. Personally, I think this poses a bigger threat to the church than the stuff we dealt with 10 years ago, church history issues, etc. I can't stress this enough. I think you'll see more talks about the organization of the church and how revelation flows through the first presidency, 1270 area presidencies, stake president, bishops, etc. Because some of these extremists think they're receiving coded messages from the general, uh, what is that? General conference talks. General conference talks. The church will re-emphasize this isn't the way it works. Elder Christopherson gave a talk literally about this subject in a Utah area meeting that every ward in Utah watched for the fifth Sunday last week. You'll see more of this. Wow, that's so interesting. Well, what's interesting about this? Because, I mean, people... Uh, I mean, QAnon is based on, like, coded messages. It's people being like... You know, like, like I was just trying to say, people who have a genuine love for the country and for, like, ending child sex trafficking and things that are obviously horrid atrocities that we don't want to see any more of. And the way that we're going to stop them is through a coded message and not actually paying attention to the broader issue of how to actually get things done, I guess is a nice way to put it. Yeah. And so people who are already programmed to look for like, oh, other people are not smart enough to get this message, but I got it. I've got the intel. And that's exactly how the people that I know that I just mentioned earlier, that's exactly how they think that they have a, a more supreme in tune spiritual intellect that can that can decode these messages more than just your average ward member that they've got it so that's that's falls right in line that with with everything we just mentioned that whole camp along with general conference talks yeah and you made a reference earlier to this idea that like the the brethren are inspired and you know follow the prophet unless they teach something we don't like like the use of masks or you know the need to get vaccinated and then we're all entitled to personal revelation to uh to sort of uh you know diverge from the path that the prophets seers and revelators have given us and basically what we're hearing here is that the you know expect messages from the church telling us what the official formal channel of communication is you know personal revelation yep. personal spirit and eh, not so much look for it to come prophet first presidency quorum of the 12 general authorities area or authorities down to stake leaders it's, it's kind of like when Joseph Smith was translating with the Peepstone and then was it Hiram Page that wanted, you know, to get in on the action of, of being able to have his own inspiration through the Peepstone. Do you remember what happened? Hiram Page? Wasn't it Hiram Page? Joseph was like, ah, yeah, that, that, that Peepstone interpreting, that's kind of my job. Uh -huh. You got to back off. He, listeners and viewers, tell us in the comments if, uh, if it wasn't Hiram Page, but, but, you know, the church is always having to fight this tension of, prophetic authority and personal revelation. Yep. It, it, it wants to hold uh, both, but it's problematic. So yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. So follow the, you know, follow the brethren. No, no, no. Follow the spirit. As long as it tells you to follow the brethren. If the spirit tells you not to follow the brethren, then follow the brethren. So basically I always follow the brethren. <laughs> yeah. And if I can, is this true? Do you know this for a fact? I'm going off of something that somebody told me at the book of Mormon evidence conference. So I'm going to hold that with a little distance that the church has, stock in like big pharma stocks sure yeah course. yeah 
And so I think a lot of the conspiracies are led to that, that Russell Nelson is going to be doing and saying things uh, because he's trying to, you know, stay in line with the corporate narrative of what big pharma would want him to do. So there's going to be certain areas that they can discount. And then other areas like not accepting their gay family and friends, they're right on point with Russell on that. (laughs) Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Okay. So that's, that's the conservative uh, schism that's happening within Mormonism, according to our Mormon scoops, deep throat. Now quickly to a really brief mention of a topic about women Um, And I'm just going to read this because it's really brief. Basically, he made the point that state council, which I guess is different than high council, um, and what's different about state council than high council is that state council includes state women leaders. He says that state council is, is held just as often as high council now. So I guess apparently in the past, it's been the norm for state high council to meet with just men much more frequently than state council that included the women. And now they're increasing state council so that more women can be involved in, I guess, at least being made aware of state business, but maybe even to be more involved in decision-making throughout the state. I mean, that seems to be an unambiguous good. What do Mm -hmm. you think? Yeah. I'm just, I'm curious what the people's reaction is to that then. If they're like great or they're like, "Mm -mm." I'm sure there's women that are like more worthless meetings. That's the last thing I needed. I know. <laughs> Let's turn on Mormon stories. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> take, a, take a word from our sponsor. Welcome to boring meetings. <laughs> taking a break. Mormon stories. Uh, really quick. Hey, viewers and listeners, please know that we're going to be sharing the link to this uh, StreamYard um, broadcast in just, uh, you know, 10 or 20 more minutes. And we want to hear from you, our live in callers, uh, to join us. So be ready once we're ready to share that link to join us. Okay. Now to kind of how COVID is affecting, um, you know, activity along the Wasatch Front. We've all wondered, haven't you? Like, it, has church activity dropped since COVID um, in any sustainable way? Uh, this is a comment uh, that he made about that. Um, and here it is. Kara, do you want to go ahead and read that? Starting to be, oh, sorry, remote viewing of sacrament and state conference. Quote, so, so basically, obviously, they've been holding stake uh conference and sacrament meeting over zoom yeah so that people you should say zoom because remote viewing is a whole other thing (laughs) oh oh, it is yeah do you know what remote viewing is is we'll talk about it later psychic stuff again stuff my family's into (laughs) starting to be controversial many want to keep it but others feel like it's giving people an excuse not to go to church yeah so so some want to keep i mean i think people enjoy their brunch they enjoy they're learning they're learning about the concept of second saturdays which is kind of a post Mormon conference. They're realizing not getting your kids dressed up for church. That is a high that nothing can top, <laughs> except for Mormon stories. Yeah, tune in Mormon scoops. Yeah, and brunch and just like walks and yeah. and hanging out and just loving your family and you can enjoying literally, like, them. Listen like, to church while you're like walking through the park or for the, through the forest. Yeah, Don't take that away from them. It's compelling. So anyway, there's controversy in the stake about whether we keep remote viewing or, or cancel it Um, because obviously church attendance is down. We're going to be talking about that in just a second, but let's move on to what he's calling COVID apathy. Take it away, Kara. I hope I can read all these words. Quote, three years ago, if you would have asked me if I think the church is any real danger of is in any real danger. It's a typo he wrote. I'm still perfect. In any real danger of withering up and drying away, I would have said no. But post-COVID, I think I'm less certain in that conclusion. Sacrament meeting attendance is down. Youth programs are not functioning. Remember, the church launched them in January of 2020. And priesthood slash Relief Society attendance is down. In short, people realized that they could miss church twice a month and the world didn't end and they enjoyed it. So... This won't result in people leaving in droves now, but it'll but it'll result in generational weakness across the church. Two families on our street that were active basically only come to church when it's convenient, which is less than once a month. Anything interesting about that to you, Kara? Yeah, just like you said, people are recognizing that the world doesn't end and life can still go on and you can still have spirituality. You can still, you know, follow the rules and the structure and have a very fulfilling life without all of the other rigmarole. I think it's worse. I think people are realizing that they can sometimes have a happier, healthier life without going to church on Sunday. Yeah. 
you just don't have a calling to even go to. You don't have to like do all this like anxiety and prep throughout the week. Like, Being a member of the church is a high demand like lifestyle. Yeah. And just to take a little bit of that pressure off, you know, that analogy in church where it's like you have a backpack full of rocks and then you get to the top of the, you know, that, that story that they always tell. And it's like, you get to the top of the mountain and the mean girls put backs rocks in the girl's backpack. And then you realize you don't need all of those backs, the atonement, repent. No, the backpack full of rocks was all of the rigmarole. It was all <laughs> of the extra stuff that you don't have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just have to realize that, you know, staying home with your spouse, playing with your kids, going on hikes, just having family time. Watching Mormon stories. Watching Mormon stories. <laughs> that's that's precious time. Precious time. So Reallocated. The, the church is competing with joy, basically. So church in its sacrament, sacrament meeting is competing with brunch and joy. Yeah. I would not want to compete with brunch and joy. Mm -mm. Would you? I cannot. I mean... Hello, Mormon stories demographic of parents who have had to get kids in their church clothes and screaming, keeping them quiet in sacrament meeting. That is a ball of stress. And no parent has ever done that in church and said, there's no place I'd rather be than right here. No, not a single human. <laughs> said no one ever. Said no one ever. <laughs> it is, I'd rather be anywhere than here right now. And Heavenly Father, this is just a note to Heavenly Father. If you want the world to be prepared for Jesus coming back, you should not have sent COVID. And if you want your one true church to grow uh -uh. and consume all the earth, you should not have sent COVID. Or separating the wheat from the tares, John. Oh, okay. That's that's a good point. Okay. Uh, the next quote we've already mentioned, but uh, we're just going to mention it again because this is in his words. This is a direct quote. It's about the level of active disbelief in his stake. There's this term that you used in the intro, PIMO, P-I-M-O, for our Never Mormon listeners, which is actually half of our total audience. Pimo means physically in, Finish mentally it. out. So it's basically people like me and Margie for the 11 years after we lost our faith, where we're like, well, we want to raise our kids in the church. We like the community. We live here in Utah. And, you know, we'll catch a lot of family grief if we leave the church. And so we'll just stay in it, but we really don't believe. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, the question is how, what percentage of, you know, members are Pimos. And this is this is anecdotal, but this is a stake high councilman on the Wasatch Front. It's his opinion. Do you want to read that, Kara? Yeah. My estimate, estimate, what is the estimation. estimation? I can read. My estimation is that 30 to 40 percent of active members don't believe literally. This is a guess based on my conversations with mostly men in my ward and stake. Ooh. Yeah. And like, again, it's anecdotal. So we're not claiming this is a scientific study, but like an active stake high councilman along the West Edge front is saying this. He's saying he's talking to other stake. He's talking to other stake high councilmen. He's talking to bishopric members. He's talking to leadership throughout the stake. He's traveling from ward to ward. And this is what he's finding out. And I have no reason to think that it really would be that different because I really think that the stake is a representation of the surrounding area. Yeah. Think about like, think about, um, you know, uh, you know, the Thanksgiving point area, Alpine, Lehigh, Highland. Think about BYU and all the professors that don't believe anymore, but they don't want to lose their jobs. Sure. Think about the Silicon Slopes area with all those tech savvy, you know, businessmen and women who probably have stumbled on CES letter you know, they, they, they're they internet savvy. They know the writing is on the wall, but like it's good for business or it's good yeah. for family or it's good for golf. Great you know, whatever. examples. Yeah. Um, I mean, my other example, like think of all of the people who have like really in tune awareness of their self-worth. That's, <laughs> they're just like not, not checked into anywhere. So, yeah. <laughs> Care Burrell, she'll be here all week, everybody. Thanks, guys. That's good. Okay. So that's interesting. Um, but it's anecdotal. Now he goes on to talk about the youth and this is kind of a big deal. So Kara, take it away. Uh, young men are going on missions less and coming home early from missions more often. They don't go to activities as much. There is no vibrancy or vitality in the youth program. Remember the timeline, the church killed scouting in 2019 and then started new programs in January of 2020. So two years now of no real youth activities and no youth conference and no EFY or the SFY programs and the youth are suffering because of it. Yeah. So this suffering. is suffering. 
What's that? <laughs> are they suffering? <laughs> or are they living well, their best life? Actually, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But basically, the church has had dead youth programs for a couple of years. And that's kind of a serious deal. When they when they withdrew from scouting because of all the sexual abuse, pedophilia scandals that the church has committed hundreds of millions of dollars to settle all the claims within the Mormon church, um, it's really wreaking havoc on the youth programs. So that's just kind of the intro. There's, there's more. So uh, I'll read this next one, if that's all right, Kara. He goes on to write, some of this may be societal and young adults slash youth struggling with anxiety and depression. Uh, and that's true. There is a nationwide crisis uh, in terms of like young men and young women mental health. So this is clearly not just a Mormon problem. However, he goes on to write, this is like quote of the year, Claire, you're going to love this. <laughs> he writes, I had a bishop tell me that, quote, I'd love it if a young man came to my office to confess a sin with a girl, because that would mean that at least he's talking to someone, close quote. What he's basically saying there is, kid, you know, Mormon young men are so busy playing video games, being on their devices, being on social media, and having fake online relationships that they're not actually talking to other humans, let alone dating and breaking the law of chastity. Yeah. So this is a Mormon bishop saying, I'd rather my young men be breaking the law of chastity than doing what they're doing, which is nothing. And, and to be all serious, to be serious for a second, being depressed, being anxious, being holed up in their rooms. It's sad. This is sad. Something to be said for like the teen pregnancy rate plummeting That's though true. too. That's true. <laughs> less hookups. That, yeah. Less STIs in the last edge front. But, but I mean, it's a real conundrum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so weird. It's like, I wish I could high five my young men for like <laughs> making out with cheerleaders in the back of their cars after football games, but I can't. No luck. Can't do it. Um, he goes on to say, uh, talking to several people in and out of the church, this is a common refrain in every ward. The church is very aware of this. Every single training we get is how we can take stuff off the plate of the bishop so he can spend more time with and focus more on the youth. And that's important because, you know, we now know that the elders quorum president and the Relief Society president are getting a lot of the kind of serve the, the adults in the ward. Yeah. Bishops, your only calling as a bishop really is to save our youth mm -hmm. from leaving the church. Wow. Yeah. Or from, you know, anxiety and depression, self-harm, and even death by suicide. This sounds pretty stark. Yeah. That's heavy, man. Heavy stuff. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So if, if those of you who are kind of skeptics are like, oh, blah, 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 this is anecdotal. This is just this guy's opinion. Now it's time to drop into the data. So Kara, are you ready for some data? Born ready. Born ready? All right. Here is the data. First page of data. Um, he says that uh, this is, again, stake data in, in terms of sacrament meeting attendance, which includes those streaming. This is not just people actually attending. That uh, the average attendance, you know, pre-COVID was 59%. The, uh, the attendance now post-COVID is 48% for three straight quarters. So just to kind of, you know, That's put wild. a fine point on it, the, the church along the Wasatch Front, if this stake is representative of, you know, the Wasatch Front overall, and there's no reason to believe why it shouldn't be, it dropped 11 percentage points in sacrament meeting attendance from COVID. That's basically took 10% of the active membership out of the church. If that holds, and he's saying it's held for three straight quarters. Oh my gosh. So that's 10 percentage points. That's kind of a big deal. And more importantly, this stake high councilman felt like it was a pretty big deal. He goes on to write elders quorum attendance was 77% pre COVID and now is 47% over the last three quarters. And again, that's a 30 percentage point drop. In other words, a lot of men are kind of showing up for sacrament meeting dropping their kids off and then bailing for elders quorum, uh, 30 percent point, 30 percentage point drop. That's kind of a big deal. <sighs> Raindrops on roses and people bailing from church. These are a few of my favorite things. Yeah, this is a big deal. And you know, the Pew foundation would, would, you know, suggest that this is not just a Mormon problem, but, um, you know, it's important to see how this is affecting uh, the church. 
Um, all right. Uh, in terms of endowed members with the Temple Recommend, pre-COVID, it was 78%. Uh, and I'm assuming that's of the of the adults uh, in their uh, wards and stakes. Now it's 61%. So again, a 17 percentage point drop in Temple Recommend holders. And that that follows this PMO theory that like, there's a, there's a bunch of adults that don't want Temple Recommends because they're either not paying a full tithe or they don't believe anymore and they can't answer the Temple Recommend questions. So now adult Temple Recommend holders have dropped to 61%. And then there's going to be a percentage of those that just lie to get the Temple Recommend or they nuance their answers to the right. questions. So what do you think about that? those data? Uh, it makes me think that the church is toast. That, like, I don't think they're going to be able to recover from this. That well, I mean, people toast are so means they're dead. It means right. that they. You, I I think that that yeah. What I mean by toast is like this is on the way out. This is uh like Lulu Rich. This is spending a bunch of money building fancy temples, like showing off that everything's fine on the outside, and while well, it's completely a sinking ship on the inside. I mean, that's a stark interpretation. We'll see if he agrees. With I you. get one extremely unnuanced <laughs> take. Per episode. That was one. Yeah. Well, I I will just say that it definitely seems uh pretty intense. And he's gonna give his opinion uh later. Can we just thank really quickly all the people? Uh Tasha Johnson, uh Julia Allred, Sarah. Several super chats are coming in through YouTube. That's where you click on the little little dollar sign. Um and uh and donate. We pay Kara through these super chats. We pay okay. Jen. We pay Jennifer. We pay Gerardo, uh, me, all these facilities. We are so grateful for these super chats. Do you want to read a couple? Is it worth reading or should we not read them? Um, if you want us to read them, we will. And we hope that it's not disrespectful that we don't read them. We're just trying to like really, we're trying to okay. go fast that's here. That's and fine. we would stop because there's so many because people love giving us money. <laughs> We're just getting so many super chats. Well, we're Remember. grateful for the support yeah, because we couldn't do this without you. So, all oh, right. and somebody said, I'll read this one though. The world does not deserve the incredible humor of what does that say? Kara, Kara that Kara off offers. Oh, interesting. Oh, Marisa, yeah, we're not worthy. Can I just do a Wayne's World? We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. It's true. Thank you, Sarah, for for your comments about. Thanks, Kara. everyone. The Sarah Kara team. That's what that was. Okay, let's go on to more data. Um. Uh, this is about the youth. And, and Kara, are you ready for kind of, from the church's perspective, some very disturbing, troubling data? Are you ready? This is what, ke are you guys ready for what keeps the general authorities up at night? No, and, dun, 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 and stake dun, leaders, dun, 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 dun. ward leaders, yeah. parents, it's a big deal. All right, should I read it? This is significant. All right. Uh, data from one Wasatch Front Stake youth. Uh, young men priesthood meeting attendance, 84% was the average in 2018, 2019, now have an average of 60% attendance over the last three quarters. Young women attendance. Wait, wait, wait. We just have to stop on oh, that. Oh, sorry. We just, got... just highlight. The men, that, that's the boys. That's a 24 percentage point drop in priesthood attendance uh, for young men. 24 percentage points. That's not a 24% drop. That's a 24 percentage point drop. It's a very significant reduction. Okay. Young women. Young women attendance, 88% was the average in 2018. Pre-COVID, yeah. Pre-COVID, 2018, 2019. Now have an average attendance of 63% over the last three quarters. You want to do the math on that one? Heck no. That's a 25% point percentage point drop for the young women. So this is interesting. The, the, Women, the young women attendance has declined at a higher rate than the young men um, uh, attendance in that stake. Curious. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a problem. So that is super interesting um, as well. This is probably, I think, uh, some of the biggest uh, revelation in this whole episode. Males 18 through 25 who are serving or have served a mission Pre-COVID, it was 49%. Now it is 31%. And basically, you know, that, that stat goes on that um, the percentage of young men in their ward, 90, you know, 85% reach, uh, you know, reach the age of 16 and receive uh, the, the priesthood, become priests. Only 31% of the young men are choosing to go on missions. Oh. Did you get that? Like, if you thought that through, a third of the men being raised, if, if this data 
holds true for other stakes along the Wasatch Front. Of the 80% of the young men who reach priest age and get the get get the erotic priesthood at the level of priest, 30% are choosing to serve missions. So two-thirds of the youth along the Wasatch Front are choosing not to serve missions. And we don't want to say, you know, correlation, causation, but do, what do you think? What would your guesstimate be? Is it because maybe they're just too depressed and anxious or is it because they just don't have faith in the church enough to go commit two years to their, do they not have the funds? What could the reason be? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I really do think it's sort of this, this broader national problem of just uh, mental health, depression, anxiety, isolation, video games, screen time, social media, Somehow it's wreaking havoc more on the young men than it is on the young women. And that's just, so whatever the Mormon church has done to try and strengthen its youth for the strength of the youth, especially for youth, it seems to have failed miserably for its young men. The Mormon church has failed its young men in a way even more severe than, than how it's failed its young women. Interesting. I don't know how else to interpret it. And do we have data on what keeps people active versus like, I know you've mentioned before that, like, they want them going to BYU. They want to go to a church school. They want them married. They want them locked in. They want them serving missions. And so if the, the biggest domino effect for all of that adherence to the church's principles and doctrines and attendance is a mission. What does that say for their membership in the church as a lifelong member? Yeah. Is it pretty much like kaput at that point? That's Yeah. And we're going to get to his interpretation that, that having two thirds of your young, young men decide not to serve missions is going to have a devastating effect on church demographics in the long run. And we're going to talk about that. But he also said that to, of, of the missionaries currently serving um, from their stake, two-thirds are women. So only a third of the missionaries the stake is sending out are, are, are young men. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. And he also said that a full third of the missionaries sent out from a stake come home early. Did you know who, run the, who runs the world? Who? Girls. It's true. It's true. You're taking over more mysteries. Who runs the world? Girls. It's true. Who runs the world? Jen, can you hear me? Girls. girls. Was... Jen says girls. No, but but can you, isn't that amazing that just, you know, five, ten years ago, girls, Mormon Mormon women were basically not really serving missions? Yeah. Now, two-thirds of the missionaries are young women, and only a third are young men. It is. Correct me if I'm wrong. It almost feels like a pattern of the same way that the church withheld the priesthood from black members. <laughs> and then the only way that they were going to survive in areas like Brazil and have people to run the temples and have wards that could run and have the priesthood was giving black people the priesthood. Do you feel like there's like a similar line are here? You, Cara, that like, wait, are you saying that the Mormon church only uh, has elevated the status of its women uh, as a matter of survival? I am saying Is that... that it keeps minorities um, out of positions of authority, whether that be people of different skin color, sexual orientations, or gender identities, until it is advantageous to them. That's a, that's a cynical approach. Raise your hand if you think care is being cynical, or if you agree, make comments and let us know. Because wouldn't think. that be interesting if they had to give women the priesthood because there were so few men that were able to lead the church? <laughs> that's interesting. Imagine entire, like, we want, there's baptisms. They still want to perform baptisms, but there's so few men in a given mission area that have the priesthood. And I'm certain like, that's going to be happening. It's like they don't have enough male priesthood leadership to fill the callings required. And they're going to, at some point, that may be what causes the, you know, the prophet. When you guys do that, a revelation. Church, when you do that, will you please give me props for that? I came up with the idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> so. Are you a prophetess? You might be a prophetess. Anyway, this is serious stuff if, if this data holds true for the church. And by the way, does it, does it hold, doesn't it make sense to you, Kara, that if it's this bad along the Wasatch Front, What's it like outside of Utah? Because the Wasatch Front has so much peer pressure to be Mormon. It is you are just in the in group right here. So imagine high school, the mission dating field girls where there's like, art. You don't have another Mormon in your high school or whatever. You're in a foreign country and like Mormon. What's that? What are you guys believing? You uh, wear like socks on your hands or something? Like you have to explain like your kooky Mormonism when you live outside of the church. It's just easier to be a Mormon in a lot of respects in yeah, Utah. Yeah. So what does that so say? Like California, Texas you know, New York, East Coast, West Coast, the South, I'm guessing things are painful, <laughs> even more painful, right? Yeah. Yeah. My heart goes out to you guys. It's tough. I uh, wouldn't want to be a church leader uh, right now. Thanks to Jason Hall for the super chat, Bryce Jones, Sarah, thanks so much. Okay. Now we're going to news from LDS Church headquarters. So in addition 
to having data from his stake and from the Utah South area. He has some contacts who work at church headquarters who are also willing to dish. Who are willing to dish. share some Mormon scoops spill. with spill the tea with this uh, stake high councilman who is kind enough to share with us what he knows. So let's hear what the news is from church headquarters. This is a really, really significant and important one, Kara. Have you ever had people ask you, or have you ever thought yourself, why are we building so many gosh darn temples? Have you ever wondered that? Like in places like Austria and Rome and Italy, or even like Orem, why are we building so many temples? Have you wondered that? I've wondered, yeah. And all I can come up with is that there's like really wealthy Mormons who want to go on like a world temple trip. And they're like, we only have a hundred to choose from. Could you build some more? Well, an, an alternating theory, Kara, is just the church is growing. It's growing exponentially. And there's so many Mormons across the world that need and want, that are banging on the temple, that the temples are so full on Saturdays and Sundays that they like... People are waiting and, and like wrapping around the temples in line, trying to get in to do washings and anointings or sealings for the dead. I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah. I can't wait to be a second class <laughs> citizen when I was at Mormon. I was just like, bank, let me in there. I've had too much freedom. <laughs> so, so let's, let's see what, you know, from the inside of church temple construction, let's see what the logic is for why, uh, these temples are being built. Are you ready, Kara? All right, read this slowly and um, deliberately. <laughs> temple department in chaos. Said temple department is in chaos. Church used to have statistical models slash rubrics that determined when slash where temples are built. Now those appear to be thrown out the window. Nelson is just announcing temples in places that make no sense. Temple department is scrambling because they need to find architects and contractors to build the temples, move money around to pay for them, etc. And they're being built in areas that don't have members to support them. Vienna, Austria, for example, with 4,700 total members in all of Austria and probably 500-ish active members. Yeah, so think about Ooh. that. So basically what he's saying is is that It's as bad as we thought. <laughs> no, they they used to they used to sort of go, "Okay, look, um, you know, England or or France or Germany, the stakes have built up. We've got enough active male priesthood leadership, we've got enough attendance, we've got enough people traveling to other countries to attend other temples, it's time to build a temple. Like for decades and decades and decades, the Mormon church had a formula for why they build temples. And now what's the formula for why they build temples? It's whatever Nelson says. It's Nelson wanting to make a press release at each general conference, just announcing temples. And that's a lot of people always ask, we've announced a gazillion temples and most of them haven't been built yet. A lot. This, yeah. This explains it, but it's coming from a church employee in the temple department. So saying, this is how we used to do things that made sense. And then we get a new prophet in who's like, this is the way it's going to go because I am the prophet and nobody questions me. Even though people, I mean, anyone who's worked in any kind of position, like a group project, and you're like, I'm smarter than that person. Why are they running this show? I'm sure that's how the temple department is probably feeling right now. Where it's like, this is not how we have a functional temple department right now. Rusty, back off. Russell M. Nelson's own employees in the temple department are describing the temple department as being in chaos and that the, these decisions are, are causing everyone havoc and and uh, th they make no sense. And again, that, that stat about Austria having only 500 active members and they're building a temple, they're building a temple for basically one to two stakes. Yeah. Like, does that make any sense? Yeah. Not to mention, like, if the temple department's in chaos... And it's so expensive to build temples. How much does it cost to build a temple? I Somebody told me once it was like $60 million. Tens of millions? Tens of millions, for sure. Yeah, yeah. tens of millions. And we all know that I was, I tried to be as a, much like a Christian Christian as I could when I was in a church. And it hurt me that I didn't feel the spirit when I was at the temple. It didn't make sense to me why these ordinances need to happen. And that I'm spending so much time and money investing in a church that builds these things when that tens of millions of dollars could be going to soup kitchens, could be going to what the church spends less than 1% total on their humanitarian efforts. And not only am I just, I don't believe that I'm getting a lot of fulfillment out of this practice of going to the temple. I believe that this work is important. We could do it after we're dead maybe. And then also on top of that, this money could be allocated so much better. Totally, totally. 
some theorize that literally these temples are being built just as a status symbol, kind of as a flex to our wealth worldwide. And others say they're kind of just tourist destinations, mostly for rich, wealthy, traveling, retired Mormons to allow them to have these luxurious vacations with their posterity, you know, traveling to these luxurious foreign countries. And it's sort of like to say, hey, all you wealthy, privileged, connected, second anointing, receiving yeah. wealthy Mormons, make sure and visit the temple wherever fancy country you go in, you know, to visit with your family. I mean, yeah. And you guys tell me if you feel the same way when I was Mormon, like I tried to just describe right now, it, it was not my Christianity that told me to go to a luxurious, opulent building to go worship God. It told me to do the service in the ward, drive somebody that didn't have a car to the Bishop's storehouse and help them get food, feed the missionaries, do service and not just sit and do these ordinances over and over again in this building sitting underneath a chandelier that costs, you know, $200,000. That's how much a chandelier costs in a Mormon temple. I know that from somebody who used to work one. The point is, I don't feel like I want to ask, just kind of pull the audience. If you guys want to tell me your responses, did you feel like that, John? We were like, I don't even know the Christianity that I feel like a lot of Mormons practice. It just doesn't coalesce with this very old school, opulent version of like, showing off our wealth. That's not the Christianity that I think we're even moving into right now. Yeah, I think people want like, to move away from that. Like people need water. People need uh, vaccinations. People need sanitation. They need um, education. They need literacy. They need safety. They need schools. They need, you know, all, all sorts of things, mental health. Imagine if the church took the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars it spends every year on these temples to do dead works. Yeah. What if they took that money and actually tried to make the world a better place? And in, every in hour ways? and every hour that you spend doing these ordinances for the dead are spent on the living. Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. that would be amazing. So I really, I don't Mormon think this Church, is a free tip, free advice from Kara and John free advice. Yeah. yeah. Again, this is, this is honestly what I think would make the church live up to its name of being led by Christ. It seems obvious that this is like a red flag, that this is not a Christian church, like led by Jesus Christ, the way that it purports. It just, it hurt me when I was Mormon. I didn't feel a connection with it. And I think people are recognizing that too. Or, or maybe I'm just one of them. Or no, no the Lord's ways are higher than Kara's ways. I mean, it's also possible that the Lord knows what he's doing and we're confused. I mean, that's possible. Yeah. All of this, like scriptures that he put in about, uh, Jesus saying that he didn't, he's the son of God and he doesn't have a place to like boxes have holes, birds have nests, but I'm the son of God and I don't have any place to rest my head. He was just joking. That's metaphorical. That was a That's joke. Symbolic. He said, my house has $200,000 chandeliers. That was in the footnotes. Kara, you're, I missed you're, it. You're very cynical today. I'm very... You're kind of, you're kind of spicy. I think Red Bulls made you a little spicy. I actually had a nap. <laughs> this was after. Okay. No naps, no naps or Red Bull for Kara. She's spicy. You're spicy today. This is Mormon Scoops. This is after hours. Okay, after hours. All right, let's go on. There. But there's more from the Temple Department, from an inside source in the Temple Department. Do you want to read this, Kara? No, because I need to get my charger. Okay, I'll read it. So uh, this uh, well-placed source within the Temple Department continues, and he writes, quote, So the Missionary Department is having to scramble to find senior couples from the Mormon corridor to staff the temples. It's a chaotic mess at the moment and shows no signs of slowing down. Nelson will likely announce 10 plus temples in every general conference until he dies. Again, temple building used to be based on a rubric like X number of members and Y number of people paying tithing. And now temple announcements are simply uncoupled and unrelated to reality on the ground. It seems to be totally random where they're building. Um, that again, it's, it's a little bit repetitive, but you know, that's what Russell and Nelson's own temple department is feeling from the inside. Okay. Um, so everyone, please tell us if you are loving this episode, if you want more Mormon scoops, what night of the week you'd prefer it to be on. And we're just going to keep bringing you all of this amazing content. And I'm stalling because I'm having John read a text from Gerardo. Okay. <laughs> so Gerardo is wanting us to know that um, Super Chats are great. We want to encourage that. But also, uh, we have attached a fundraiser sort of button to this episode because uh, apparently we'll take your donations wherever they come. Super Chats are great. Gerardo's saying that, that YouTube takes 30% of the Super Chats. But if you donate to the actual fundraiser that's 
that's associated with this and other episodes. If you donate straight there, uh, you, the full amount goes to our, our nonprofit and, and YouTube doesn't skim 30%. So anyway, um, we'll try and, and make sure and remind people of this. Thanks, Gerardo. We love you. And we appreciate that. Give it up feedback. for Gerardo. Give it up for Gerardo. We love you, Gerardo. He's um, MVP of the Brad Wilcox week. Absolutely. And of many other weeks. Um, love you, Gerardo. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like, that explains, that explains the, the massive building of temples. It's, it's literally just kind of like a Russell M. Nelson flex. It's a Russell M. Nelson legacy move that's detached from uh, probably a, a real concern for the health and well-being of, of the world and people in poverty, but it's also disconnected from any reality of like, you know, active membership, faithful membership, temple recommend holding membership, or Mormon membership desiring to actually enter the temple. Wow. We now know it's literally just a legacy move, potentially by Russell M. Nelson. Interesting. Who would have thought that somebody who's 90 years old um, with a, you know, a trillion dollars in their back pocket might not make the wisest financial decisions. I don't know. I mean, or it's a good financial decision. Maybe that's part of our secret. Like maybe it encourages more people to be, pay tithing if they know they can go to the temple. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, are you going to question Russell M. Nelson's decisions as it relates to you know what I think the church cares a lot about, which is its finances. Like that's what it, I do for a living, John. He's, but he seems to <laughs> the church seems to be top notch at, at at fundraising. You know what I'm saying? At at growing its financial assets. So I mean, growing their financial assets uh, while membership goes in an op opposite statistical thing. Uh, you can have you can have a billion dollars, but if you only have a stronghold of like a million people for, and then that just dwindles and stuff, it's like you're the king of Diaper Mountain. All right, Kara. So I'm just going to ask you, would you rather have, you know, $10 million uh, and, you know, 10 million followers or $300 billion and 2 million followers? Which would you rather have? Um, I'd rather have friends and people to actually look up to me. Money, money don't cost a thing. Friends don't cost a thing. Well, that's, why, that's why you're not leading the Mormon church. Yeah. We just found Priorities. out that's not, not, not leading the Mormon church. Yeah. We need men to do that because men... Turns out. Don't you guys remember blank check from the nineties where the kid gets all of that money, but he has no, he buys all the things he ever wanted and he has no friends because it's really weird to be a kid with like a million dollars. It's kind of what I think. It's like, yeah, you got the whole candy store, but nobody's coming to visit. So. Hot take, hot take from Cara Burrell, everybody. Uh, you, I want, I want you guys to mention in the chat, would you rather have 300 or $500 billion and less, less followers or, or, uh, less money and more followers. We want to hear from you, dear listeners. Okay. Another really, Wait, what? Also, I have a joke. Okay. A joke. Um, if you guys were also wondering, Kara, me, I am in charge of making the thumbnails for these Mormon scoops episodes. So that's why they look so different than the normal Mormon stories ones, because I want to have a different vibe for these Mormon scoops episodes. And somebody was commenting that they look very nineties. They have like Zach Morris's cell phone at the bottom. And that was intentional because I wanted to get graphics from the same decade and references like to uh blank check. I want to get all my references from the same, de same decade that the Mormon church still had relevance. So. <laughs> but a bump. Okay. I'm, that was a, good. That I was am good. the least nuanced hoe in the room right now. <laughs> more, red Sorry. Bell. more red bell for care. I'm having a good time. Okay. Um, this is fun. So we're almost at 2000 live, uh, you know, viewers of our, of our, um, live stream. That's a big deal. I don't know that we've ever reached 2000 before. So that's fun. Thanks for uh, joining us, everybody. Thanks for all the super chats and Thanks, the donations. Guys. Um, more that, and yet there's more care. We're not done. So another really interesting piece of Intel is that a new temple prep course is coming out with video of the actual endowment sessions temple clothing being worn, et cetera. And we have David Bednar to thank. So, I mean, I think, I think this is kind of significant. Now, I don't know if we thank, you know, uh, you know, prophet Sears and revelators and David Bednar for making this happen. Maybe in part, this is revelation, but I think we also have to give a shout out to anyone who's ever published uh, the temple ceremony on the internet or, you know, TikTokers, I guess that, now habitually are making TikToks in their temple Dude, garb. Yeah. But I think the church has realized 
you know, we can't be the Masonic Lodge anymore. We can't keep these secret oaths and handshakes and temple clothing secret anymore. And maybe, Kara, maybe they've been listening to us about informed consent that people actually deserve to yeah. know what they're going to be doing and wearing and promising and covenanting to and doing. And so maybe we should we should train them and let them know ahead of time. Yeah. If we know you've sat in this chair for so long, having interviews with people where they said they were unprepared for the clothing, the garb, the rituals, the chanting, everything. And that gave them a negative temple experience. You don't want that. I don't want that. Ex-Mormons, Mormons, church leaders do not want people to have negative temple experiences. And wouldn't it just make sense that the best way for them to have a slightly more positive one is them having informed consent and knowing what they're going to get into. Absolutely. Like that benefits everybody by having this. So praise to the man, Bednar. Praise to Bednar and praise to everyone who's ever disclosed uh, the temple ceremony, you know, the video, the, um, you know, worn temple clothing. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that that level of disrespect had to be engaged in to coerce the Mormon church to become more transparent and to provide informed consent. Um, but that's what happened. And, you know, Let's give credit where credit is due. If it's true that Bednar is behind it, thank you, David Bednar. Um, we have more uh, news uh, regarding the temple. It We, we have heard from uh, a source, a friend of the podcast, that uh, new endowment movies are in the works. And I have good news for you, Kara. Um, these endowment movies were not directed by a uh, known um, sexual predator, Sterling Von Wagner, who is now in prison. He, of course, many don't know this, Sterling Von Wagner um, sexually molested Sean Escobar and probably several other young men in, let's just say, the 80s or 90s. Heads up Mormon Enlightenment, right? Um, he was disfellowshipped. Yeah, heads up to shout out to Crystal and Sean Escobar and the Mormon Enlightenment Facebook group. Um, the church knew this at the time. The church quietly disfellowshipped Sterling Von Wagner because he was a wealthy, prominent member who knew Robert Redford. He was one of the co-founders of Sundance. And then later, um, Sterling Von Wagner was asked as a known sex offender to, um, and, and of course the church prohibited um, family members and abuse victims from going to the police to uh, to kind of report Why this. Isn't this talked about it? more. Oh my gosh! But later, yeah. just in the past, like ten years, the church said, "Hey, Sterling von Wagner, we know about your past as a sexual predator. Let's have you direct the new temple ceremony movies." Those were the ones that came out in the late 2010s or mid to late 2010s, and let's say mid 2010s, and and then then it was discovered that Sterling von Wagner had more victims. And he oh ends up gosh. in prison and, uh, and, you know, we don't mean to be hard on him, but you know, the church needs to drop this idea of, of kind of discernment that the leaders have discernment that we can trust in their discernment. Um, and, and, but, but the good news is the, apparently the new endowment movies in the works will not be directed by Sterling Ben Wagner. Yeah. That's like, Silver lining. Small change. Yeah. <laughs> like I think David Bednar calls that tender mercies. Tender mercies. Yeah. Ugh. Is this a dark joke? This is no, it's just I Do just, we get dark? I I mean, anyone who sat in an endowment session that you've already seen the movie, like, you know, 20 times at that point in your life. Um, it's it's a, it's as if somebody's saying, I know you don't like this movie, but wait, it just got worse. And it's like, I can't handle any more bad news about this movie. And it's like, it's all just a depressing ball again, sitting on the top of Diaper Mountain. Uh. <laughs> well, we'll see how the new Temple Endowment Ceremony movies, because one thing's for sure, as Eve soon will as be they hot. come out, someone's going to film them and put them on the internet, right? I yeah. mean, it, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe you missed my won't. joke. Anyway. What was the joke? Say it said, one thing will be for sure. Eve will be hot. Evil will be hot. <laughs> what about Adam? What about Satan? Is it Lucifer hot? Um, yeah, Satan. Satan does it for me, actually. But yeah. yeah, I always think that it's kind of funny that she can show her shoulders in that in like the most sacred venue in the church. And if somebody walked into that room with their shoulders showing, they would be escorted out of the building <laughs> immediately. But true. she's allowed to be like Keep 20 feet tall on a big projector. It's um, it's it's a paradox. Yeah, it's that's at least the least of what it is. <laughs> a sexy paradox. All right. Um, I hear Jen laughing in the background. <laughs> Jen, Jen likes your jokes. Jen gets your jokes. I'm, uh, I do too. Great. Yeah. High five. Knuckles. Okay. Um, 
one at least one more piece of news and uh this will be the final segment of the episode and then we're gonna have to share uh the link of Streamyard uh with all of you so that um you can start calling in because it's time to have you what do we want them call to call in, in about who who are we uh propositioning here yeah so uh why don't you tell them while i paste the link in the youtube description is that all right can you can you uh Guide the conversation for a second while I do that. Is that all right? I honestly don't know what we want people to specifically call in and talk about. That's my just question. any reactions to today's episode. Okay, just uh, reactions. Maybe you have some intel. Maybe you are a sitting stake president. You don't have to be. We're not gatekeeping here. You can just be, you know, in the nursery. It doesn't matter. We want to have people call in and talk about what is what's help us put our finger on the pulse of what's happening in your local area and congregations or just your reactions to this episode. Any other points that we missed? I'm sure there's a lot of them about, you know, temples, youth, membership, missions. What do, what are your reactions? What do you have to say? Yeah. Should that basically summarize it? Absolutely. And then um, our lovely um, new Mormon Stories employee over there, Jen, who is beautiful. She's actually ravishing. She um, changed our life for the better. And I'm not just saying that because she um, cleaned up the Mormon Stories studio and laughs at all of my jokes. That's the least of the things she's done. She's also, we're going to be announcing at the end of the program, some amazing, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, faith, faith. Faith crisis, faith events crisis events and support groups. Support groups. That's what I was looking for. Support groups that she's been working really hard. Um, and we're going to start promoting those. And so if you're in faith crisis and you need extra support, we're going to have a whole program um, to help you with that. So Jen's a rock store. When a hero comes along. That's that's our hero is uh, Jen over there. And somebody asked earlier, has Kara been smoking a little, a little wacky tobacco? I actually haven't. It literally is just a nap and an and being with Margie today, Margie is, she's the drug. Margie's the drug. When I'm around Margie, drugs are not necessary. Um, that's how much she invigorates me. So this is a nap in Margie. Okay. And Jen's agreeing. Okay. And, yep. okay Thank so you for that. Thank you for you that. Want to call you, in? you were able to give me enough time to paste now the StreamYard link into uh, the Facebook comments and the YouTube comments, and I've also pasted them into the YouTube description. So what we want to do now is invite you, the listeners and viewers, to join us. Make sure you enable your camera. Make sure you enable your microphone. Join us right now in the live stream. We would love to be getting hot takes from you as you join. And uh, before we actually um, start bringing on our callers and listeners, we have one last piece of news. Um, this source that I talked with, um, actually, uh, told us one last cool bit of news. And that bit of news is, uh, the following that there are, uh, new policies coming down regarding one-on-one -on -one interviews regarding sexual worthiness that are going to be much more strict and much more prescriptive, um, more strict, more strict in terms of what questions leaders aren't able to ask. So better. So better. We're moving in the right direction. So we are because of Sam Young, shout out to Sam Young because of his amazing work. Um my inside source from this stake uh along the Wasatch Front who has spoken with inside church leaders has told me that we can expect um and I misspelled worthiness there. We can expect the church to even go farther basically really limiting what bishops, what questions bishops and stake presidents and mission presidents are and aren't allowed to ask in terms of sexuality. We have been hammering, Sam Young, Protect LDS Children, We on Mormon Stories, we have been hammering the Mormon church over the past, you know, five to 10 years about how inappropriate it is, these one-on-one -on -one interviews asking sexually explicit questions. And it looks like that is going to change for the better, along with uh, I think the ability to bring other people in to the interviews. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't have much more to say on that for now, but um, we're really excited about it. And uh, shout out again to Sam Young and everyone at Protect LDS Children who's made that possible. Amazing. Okay. So now I, I hope you guys have enjoyed, uh, Kara, I hope, was that interesting? Was that worth, was this just clickbait or was this actually worth you know, the, the headline, what do you think? Hugely worth. We yeah. put a question mark on it in decline. No, it's exclamation point. <laughs> don't put a question mark on that. Put in a, put a, uh, no, put a, don't put a question mark. Shut up. Oh, sh okay. All right. No, that's good. I, I hope Kara, did you, did you feel like 
this information was interesting and worthwhile? Um, I have never been more uh, like jazzed. <laughs> I'm a, uh, oh yeah, people say it's, it's Margie, it's a nap. And it's also uh, like recognizing that we could retire tomorrow. We'll be here for people in faith crisis, but we don't have to do anything like then this the episode. church will like, it's, it's crumbling before our eyes. It's wild. There you go again. Like, we don't know. Maybe these changes are going to lead to the church getting more healthy and more healthy, stronger. They'll be more healthy. But I mean, the day the internet was invented and it's been. All right. So Kara, I'm not, I'm not nuanced today. I'm not not nuanced. I'm holding space for the possibility that these changes might make the church stronger in the end. Who knows, Kara? Who knows? Hope Mm -hmm. springs eternal. Yeah, this is John. You wouldn't get a temple recommend right now because it looks like you're not. Are you saying having, my nose is growing? No, yeah, I'm saying you're not having honest interactions with your fellow woman. Okay, all right. Now's the time to bring on our uh, some of our listeners, and we'll just ask people keep it PG. Don't be rude. Don't be mean. Don't be a cynic like Kara is today, and um, keep it short. And we want to bring on as many of you as possible to provide perspective. And I'm super happy to know that our first guest is going to be Gerardo Sumano. Gerardo, Gerardo Sumano, welcome is, to Mormon Scoops. Joining us, Gerardo, what's going on, brother? <laughs> hey guys, I just uh, hopped on just last minute uh, from my kitchen um, <laughs> just to say hi. Man, I, I didn't even know about. I mean, you you've had that all that information for for a while. I've been holding out um, on you, Gerardo. I know. I didn't know <laughs> a, a lot of that stuff. It's kind of. I, I mean. What was the most interesting thing to you or what were some of the most interesting things to you that are, that you'd want to mention or any other takes that you want to mention? Um, well, it was kind of pretty compatible with what I've heard from other people, um, you know, here in the Wasatch Front about um, people losing their faith. I, I have friends from BYU-Idaho who have contacted me now and who have now lost their faith. And that's kind of been their experience. It was because of COVID and not going to church anymore. Um, you know, that kind of like started making them, uh, allowing them to, to think a little bit about, uh, just the shelf items that they, that they had, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I thought it was really interesting about the temple department, uh, saying that they're kind of scrambling and struggling with, uh, President Nelson's announcements. It just reminded me, I, I, in some occasion, I think you had, a uh, uh, someone in Mormon stories talking about uh, how usually when employees in the church, uh, even the ones that work really closely with apostles, they're not really willing to tell them like what their struggles or what like the tasks that they're being like are asking employees to do are like hard or impossible. Uh, They kind of want to treat them like, you know, just keep them with the super superficial, super positive stuff. Uh, so sometimes apostles don't really get, you know, the truth about how things are are really what how things are, um, y- you know, kind of being hard for church employees. So I don't yeah, know. Like, when I worked at Microsoft, there was this idea like you don't, you know, a lot of people were afraid to give Bill Gates bad news, right? And yeah, there's that whole king has king has no clothes. You don't want to ever tell the king they don't have clothes, and the shoot the messenger deal. And I've heard that at church headquarters people are not into being honest and open with the top church leaders. And uh, whenever you have a patriarchy and a culture that, um, that encourages leader worship to too much of an extent, you're not going to get good Intel that helps you make good decisions. That's a good point, Gerardo. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all I wanted to say. Well, all right. Well, we love you. Thanks Gerardo. Salute Gerardo. Mm-hmm. We're not worthy. <laughs> for you do for your MVP trophy. Thanks, Roberto. <laughs> Joining right. us. We'll talk soon. Bye. Right, we'll see you soon. Well, I'm super. Uh, I'm super excited that Maven is joining us. Maven, Maven. you, uh, Maven, don't you help out with uh, with uh, you know Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon and Mormonism Live? Yes, I do. I'd like to think that I'm helping out, and, yeah. and that's what people are saying so far. So as as long as um, people are saying it, then I'll believe it, and I'm happy to keep doing it. And we're we're huge fans of Mormonism Live. That's why we will never hold a live stream intentionally. Sometimes we forget, but we're committed to never holding intentionally a live stream on Wednesday evening because at six twenty Mountain Time, Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon and Maven bring to you Mormonism Live. And we believe that are in the ex Mormon world, 
a rising tide lifts all ships. Yes, yes. And we appreciate you guys too. And we, we reference you guys as well in your show on ours. So it's nice to have the partnership and yeah. So Maven, what, what did you, was this, was this just clickbait or what, did you um, have any reactions to today's episode? I mean, I had, a, I had a few different thoughts, but I'll just, I'll just stick to one. Um, I got a question for you guys. So I was thinking about the number of the, we'll say like the, the ultra conservative that maybe the doomsday last days types um, who are leaving the church over their cognitive dissonance. I almost feel like it's because the church isn't, um, I guess, old fashioned enough or even crazy enough sometimes. Um, for them and that's why they're leaving and i'm just not sure if that's a good thing or not are they leaving for even worse things or um you know things that are, are going to see more violence and, and more escalation potentially in the future as they feel they're getting backed into a corner by government conspiracy or, or gay agendas and all of these things um or once they're out of the church do you think eventually um they they might start coming around what do you what do you think is kind of the general What's happening to these people who are leaving the church and where are they going? What's their journey? That's such a great question, Maven. Yeah. I mean, some are following Denver Snuffer, uh, you know, believing that they can get their own witness of Christ and doing kind of these, these meetings in their homes, kind of home church where they're empowered, reading Denver Snuffer scriptures, passing the sacrament to each other with their own authority. There's that going on. There's those that are following people like Julie Julie Rowe and others that have emerged as kind of apocalyptic Mormon social media stars. And that doesn't bode well because we know that that, that is the culture that literally led to Julie Rowe and Chad Daybell. Sure. Sorry, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and the, the, the death of those beautiful children that were innocent. Um, yeah, it's a scary thought. I think a lot of schismatic churches are going to be developing maven um that's not good uh although you could argue that maybe the church would be better off without these kind of desnat types that would tend to potentially um create a culture within the church ward or stake environment that would make a lot of other people want to leave so from the church's standpoint there yeah. might be a good riddance element of like separating the wheat from the tares on the Maybe right finally. The What's <laughs> but that? the church's teachings really laid the foundation for that. Like when you say chickens coming home to roost or by their fruits, I guess you could say um, the church, uh, almost everything the church does really actually supports conspiratorial thinking where, you know, your authorities are who versus, you know, data and things like that. I guess I just thought of one more question. Um, yeah. You said it's a big thing. So I'm wondering, are, are there more people leaving and on this extreme uh you know, this, this extreme end of things, or is it still more people who are, are just leaving because they're unhappy or because they don't believe or, you know, because it's not working for them? You know what I mean? Yeah. This, this stake high councilman member said that the number of people leaving for kind of faith reasons, LGBTQ reasons, progressive reasons is a fraction. He, I think he said five times the number in his stake are leaving uh, because they're ultra conservative five times are leaving because of that than, than for liberal or progressive reasons, which I don't know if it's true. But. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah. I just don't know if that's a good thing or not. I, I, I know. know. Maybe okay, I, want to, I, want to, I want to extend you an invitation to uh, come tell your story on Mormon Stories podcast. You heard yeah. it first here. Okay. We'd love to have you. <laughs> uh, if you want, if you want to tell your story on Mormon Stories podcast, we'd love to have you. So reach out to oh us God. and we'll get that on the schedule if you want to. But thanks so much for all you do. You are a sharp and we need more people like you uh, in the in the conversation. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks All for right. having stay, me on. Stay in touch, Maven. Come again, okay? All right. All right. Thanks, Maven. Uh, now we have, um, let's see. Now we have Jeremy Heiner, uh, who has been waiting for a bit. Hey, 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 Jeremy. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Jeremy, you're on with Karen John on Mormon Scoops. What do you got for us? <laughs> Well, I think you're, that Charlie. You're rocking your BYU shirt. Are you calling as a BYU student? A uh, former BYU I student, graduated in 2015. Go Cougars. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the Charlie uh, Bird story really caught my eye today. Um, I mean, it's been interesting to watch his journey. I I remember because I'm a I'm a gay former Mormon now Exmo I guess you could say. Um, I was where he was at a few years ago, like. 10 years ago. And so it's been interesting to watch his journey. And I would place money on that in five years, he's going to be 
um, if not completely out of the church, certainly reduced because in his podcast today, he mentioned as soon as he graduates from BYU, he's going to go date his uh, boyfriend, like for reals. And, and how are you supposed to stay in the church? Yeah, exactly. He can't. Yeah. And he also did reference Mormon Stories podcast in his uh, little podcast. He That's didn't call true. It, oh. Didn't mention you by name, but he did mention you guys. He followed the Voldemort rule of, of kind of like he who shall not be named. So he said, yeah, yeah that he heard a podcast had talked about, you know, him and, and Ben. And that that uh, on the one hand, they wanted to say that they didn't listen to the podcast and that it was kind of full of misrepresentations. And then on the other. So how do they know it was full of misrepresentations if they didn't listen to it? Because it really wasn't about them; it was about uh, the the position they hold. But then, on the other hand, they they acknowledged that what we were speculating about was actually, in fact, true, and that they were dating, like we we thought they might, based on the mm -hmm. intelligence we'd received. So, we we all know how this plays out. They're going to be, you know, within five to ten years, they're going to be out of the church, and apologizing yep. to everyone for what they did. What do What That's do you my think? Guess. One hundred percent. That's how yeah. what happened to me. I mean, I used to be the biggest like fan of the church. The whole reason I went to BYU Idaho was to, I guess, pray the gay away, but that didn't work. And you know, came out the day after I got my diploma, publicly on Facebook, and haven't looked back since. It's been an amazing journey. Well, we are we are just so delighted uh, that you would join us, Jeremy. Thanks for following us on Mormon Stories. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Please stay in touch. All right, brother. Yeah, we'll do. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Next on the show is Kendall. Kendall. Kendall, how you doing? Let's unmute you. I'll unmute you. Where are you joining us from, Kendall? What? Where are you joining us from? Daybreak. Oh, Daybreak. We mentioned you in the episode. <laughs> Daybreak yeah, actually is fairly different. It's more progressive. Than, than it's more progressive. <laughs> There's really not a whole lot of Mormonism going on. If not, I know more people who are never most here. Okay. All right. Well, well, Kara, you stand corrected. What did I say? I said they're I, all pretty I, much the same. Did you say all the Mormons from Daybreak down to, to Spanish Fork are the same? I think, it, Kendall, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kendall's I feel like naughty. Daybreak is because it's like this planned community of you know houses that were have all just been built recently there's not like a lot of holdover like long generational mormons in a certain area that you'd get in like the provo neighborhood i might have grown up in or in draper you where people have been in a neighborhood for a long time there's a lot of transplants you could say to daybreak that's very guess. true well tell us what you've tell us what you've got for us uh and you know any reactions or comments uh, i think one of the biggest things for me is that when you guys were saying that now they're now, like the brethren leaders are saying that um, not to take general conference talks as pure like guidance for things to answer questions. Because since I was like 12, it has been aggressively taught. Pray before you watch general conference, have your notebook, find your answers, follow it as modern day scripture. I just find that very interesting how now that's totally being taken aback. And I'm just kind of like, it feels very discrediting to me. Yeah. Cause some of the, yeah, they'll say that you'll find personal revelation. If you have mm -hmm. like, you pray before you have an answer on your mind or you have a question on your mind, go into general conference and that'll be something that'll like, yeah. that'll be your answer. Like listen with a pure intent and an open heart. And yeah, that's, that's a really good point. The, that's going to lead to a lot of dangerous personal revelations. Is that making you sad, Kendall, a little bit? or It's just kind of like, I don't know, just after being told like so much and then taking back, I'm like, okay, where was this before? <laughs> Why is it now? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good, good point, Kendall. Well, we, were, we really appreciate you calling in and yeah. sharing your perspective. It's so fun to have you. I hope we can meet you in person someday. She was at my party. I'm like, you oh. met me, John. Dude. Oh, yeah. crap. I just got embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. I can't she remember. Was at my thrive after well, you weren't wearing that red sweater. So I switched. No, I wasn't. My hair is up. Hair up. You, are, you buds with, are you buds with Kara? I hadn't met before that night, but <laughs> yeah. I'm friends with Tim. Thanks Pearson. for embarrassing everybody. That's Give how it. I. You were so wasted, dude. It's just uh, like yeah, I was too wasted at the party. I was wasted. I was just out of control. Anyway, okay, it's nice to meet you again, Kendall. Love ya. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> now I'm now I'm embarrassed. I feel shame. Uh, his cheeks are red. Look at him. <laughs> All right. Next to join us is Callie. Um, let's unmute you, Callie. And uh, where uh, where are you joining us from, Callie? Hi, I am joining you from Okinawa, Japan. I'm here yeah. with the military. Yeah, my husband and I got kicked out of BYU, Idaho. He was my FHG brother, and now I'm at in Okinawa. Oh, <laughs> wow. I don't want to make jokes about yeah. something that was probably really tra traumatic for you guys. Uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I graduated oh. from BYU. What up? What up? Wolverine, was... right? Wolverine fighting Wolverines. So, <laughs> yes, so you yeah. Okay. Yeah, UVU. Yeah, I graduated UVU. Best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So I have been looking forward to this episode because it's been so validating. Um, my family has been very Denver snuffer for my whole life. It terrified me. And there's the moderate side and the extreme side. So it's validating to see that this is not a phenomenon just in my family, but watching COVID specifically bring my moderate family members over to the more conspiratorial side, seeing my family members say things like, I believe that the Lord will lead the prophet astray. You know, it's interesting to watch them kind of undo their faith over these issues. So it's fascinating to see that this is not just a phenomenon in my family, but it's much broader. Yeah. Is that, is that comforting or disturbing? Which is it? <laughs> oh God. I guess it's Gosh. validating. It's gotta be validating. It's, it's very validating. And um, yeah, just fascinating because some of us have left because we are more progressive. And so seeing that the church is being pulled in both ways, um, I can't imagine being the church trying to toe that line. Um, very, yeah, very interesting. A lot of family members leaving over vaccination issues and um, worries that the church is being led astray by the devil or by the Democrats or whoever it may be. So it's kind of bizarre world a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Well, Kelly, it's so yeah, fun you can join us from Japan. I was like, it looks like yeah. right there. I was like, <laughs> yeah, it's um, it is one oh six p.m. tomorrow there oh, awesome. we're finding some ex-mormons out here what's in the tomorrow military, like so. tell us what tomorrow's like what do we have to look uh, forward to? tomorrow is rainy and wonderful <laughs> yeah <laughs> well thank you for everything you guys do seriously helps me and my husband tremendously well we oh, love it so we good. love our jobs and we're grateful you called yeah. in say hi to say hi to thank your dear you. husband all right okay we'll do thanks kelly thanks for calling mm -hmm. thank you all right um let's go to trevor trevor's been waiting patiently um, I'll unmute Trevor. Trevor, Trevor you're on with uh, John and Kara on Mormon Scoops. What do you got for us? <laughs> hey, guys. Um, love your shows. Um, I've been watching for about a year. But, John, um, you made a comment about how um, the temple um, video is coming out to, like, they'll show what's happening in the temple. And the other night on a late night drive, I was watching a think the do mormons get their own planet podcast and you made a comment saying that exmos uh will complain about the church not changing and then when the church does change that will complain about it and when you said that tonight about the the new video coming out it felt like for me i can only speak for me um being out of the church for 10 years it's not that they change their position. It's how they're not discussing while why they're changing it. Um, that's that's what my issue is. I don't mind people changing their views or or positions. It's let's be honest and up front about wild why they're changing it. That's all I wanted yeah. to say. You guys are great. Oh my gosh, Trevor! Can I just say there's so much I love about your comment. Number one, we are we don't want to be the new prophets gurus right. so we love people challenging us we want to be called on our stuff so i love that thank you for talking uh, truth to us and your perspective thanks for calling us out i think you're right it is hypocritical of post-mormons or liberal mormons if they're calling for change 
and then they make fun of or or criticize or denigrate the change. That's a great point. And then your point about uh, we should be celebrating change and good change. And honestly, it was my intent to do that. I think we did that. A fair I think amount, we tried right? a little cool. bit to do that. But you make a good point that it should be celebrated and encouraged, not belittled and, and made fun of and mocked. But well, then, right. And then, yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Um, I just, I don't, it wasn't quite a criticism. I just wanted to voice um, that it's, it's not the fact that, um, oh, geez. Yeah, I'm, I'm that they should tell it, they should explain it. why. When they make a change, yeah. they should explain why instead of just, yes. It was revelation when we created the exclusionary policy in 2015 and God told us to change it later. Like, come on. Yeah. That's exactly. not exactly. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. this is my literal, what I love about your comment is because it touches on a subject. That's my favorite thing to talk about in Mormonism. And Bill real did a podcast that I've listened to nine times. I'm going to paste it in the show notes because I want everyone to listen to it. I think it's so important because I know I've talked a lot about the church like crashing and burning and stuff, but my real intent is for the members to do exactly what you just said, which is recognize that when things are changing, it's because of the agitation. It's from the outside pressure from the bottom up and the outside in. And there's this great right. podcast that Bill does um, all about dogma where he dissects this conversation between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson talking about dogma within religions can only perpetuate and go on if people are told that things are too sacred to be able to challenge them. And so members, they're they can't just keep on going along with like, oh, this new change happened. That's so wonderful. We have to we have to look at what did Mormon stories do? What did John Dillon do? What did Sam Young do? What did the people that were you know, the anti-Mormons or the progressives, what did they actually do to ordain make, women, right? ordain women? What yeah. did they do to make Mormonism something that you all benefit from now, but the church doesn't want to acknowledge that, that their best ideas come from the agitators. And so that's why I like, I'm fired up and I do what I do at Mormon Stories because I know that we move the, the ball forward. Just like with Brad Wilcox's thing, if we didn't talk about it, if we didn't agitate a little bit, there wouldn't be, you know, a slight change. It wouldn't be able to have the church tell Brad to pull back this racist rhetoric anymore. It has to come from people saying we demand changes and we're not going to put up with this anymore. No curtain of secrecy or sacredness anymore. That's how we make change and how we make Mormonism healthier. Yeah. Exactly. And, and also this might be repetitive, but the church has to stop blaming awful things on God. And that's what Brad Wilcox did. It's like, well, God, God made the change about blacks in the priesthood. We don't know why God was racist for so long. Just stop ruining God for so many people. Maybe. I mean, stop blaming things on God that really, are about more about you, the church leaders, than God. Yeah, his ways are mysterious. Are his ways racist? Are his ways were sexist? <laughs> yeah, um, I'd like to. Yeah. Hey, where are you? Where are you calling from, Trevor? If you're able to share. Uh Portland, Oregon. Very cool. Keep Portland, yes. Portland weird, brother. <laughs> Very weird. We love it here. All right. Well, Trevor, we're so delighted that you joined us on Mormon Stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye, take man. care. Thanks for calling in. All right. Well, I have to go next to Maxim Maximus Minimalist. Uh, this is so. Do you really fun. need that hat? That hat. For the, uh, uh, yeah. I apologize for all the pseudonyms. Exactly. I'm on the uh, the chat room as uh, Yeshua, and a quick story about that. So I was born. My birth certificate. My real name is was Mormon. <laughs> really. Yes. Oh it's, wow, you were named no, no lie about this. And I'm I'm I just want to say thank you uh on behalf of uh about a thousand extended family members that I have. I'm a Polynesian, uh born and raised right out here in little Provo called uh Laie, Hawaii. And uh, I grew up uh much like all the listeners and the, the folks that have been throughout your podcast uh sharing their stories. So you know, I left uh to join the military at 17 is also when I left the, uh, the organization. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really interesting to be alive to, to see the, uh, internet and the technology being used, uh, for something uh, as powerful as this to, to help those that are in a crisis, as you, as you mentioned, in need a lot of hurting individuals. I mean, I see them daily, family members, friends, uh, classmates, and I'm I'm the black sheep, of course, like probably you two and everyone else. I, I'm I'm the rogue uh, defector. Uh, however, I've I've stood my ground, um, and I, I'm just I'm just very 
moved by the uh, the organization that you have to, to reach out. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wow, I we we I'm we are so moved and touched. We're so glad you joined us from Hawaii. We're so glad to have one of our Polynesian brothers and sisters reach out to us, and that's just so meaningful to hear that that from so far away we've been able to be a small part of your healing and growth. That's kind of that's our that's our all joking aside all sarcasm and sometimes cynicism aside that's why we do what we do mm -hmm. and it means so much that you would uh join us and and share that so thank you brother thank you what is this is this what it is is this the is that the thing is that it right there aloha what does and, that mean and, and when you guys come and have the uh, get togethers the uh, fellowships that you do uh, i'll be your uber driver van driver host dude so hawaii. are you are you saying thrive hawaii is on is that what you're saying Yes, come come to Hawaii. <laughs> All right, I'll tell my buddy Clint and and Natasha. Thrive Hawaii is on, brother. Hang loose. Jen, Jen and Jen Kara want to come. Do you want to come to Thrive Hawaii? Yeah. Jen's saying she wants to come too. Come on, right. my leg. I'll do it. Thanks for joining us, brother. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. It's so great to have you. All right. I don't know how long we're going to be able to go here, but Kristen's uh, Kirsten. Kirsten has been waiting patiently. Hey, Kirsten. Hi. Where are you joining us from? Uh, American Fork. AF. Yeah. You're, uh, you're Mormon AF, apparently. I am. I am Mormon AF. <laughs> <laughs> or are I'm you ex-Mormon AF. <laughs> you're ex-Mormon AF? All right. Yeah. I love it. So tell us, we, we're, we're kind of short on time. We want to be wrapping up. Tell us really quickly what comment uh, you want to make about today's show or anything well, else. Well, I, I mean, I have so many comments I want to share, but I'll just share one. Um the temples being built were really, really surprising. I mean, I don't really watch conference anymore, but my family does. All of my family is LDS. Um, I'm kind of the black sheep too. <laughs> um, but they, they told me, they're like, oh, there's going to be a temple built in Orem. And I was like, Orem is surrounded by three temples. Like, <laughs> why does it need a temple? And they're like, we don't know. The prophet just said that it needs a temple. And I was like, all right then. <laughs> um, and I just, I don't understand why the church needs to be putting so much money out into temples when, like Kara said, you could just put that into people and be doing so much more good that way than being yeah. building shiny temples. I so. love it. Right. Well, Kirsten, that's an important comment. Is that an American Fork temple? Uh, yes, Tempinogus. there is. That's Tempinogus. Tempinogus, yeah. All right. Well, it keeps you righteous, right? It keeps, it keeps the bad thoughts away, right? Well, I, I can't, I can't get away from it. It's, it's <laughs> right up there on the hill. It increases you see it property every values. time you're on the freeway. So just think yep. that it helped increase your property values. Just... Oh, it does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kirsten, we're so happy you joined us. Thanks for thanks All so right. much for calling in for America. Thank you guys. Uh, Thank you for everything you American do. Folk people. You too. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for your support. Thanks. All right. Let's bring on Cherish, aka Christian Friend. Christian Friend, who is not a man. <laughs> Hi. Um, no, I was just going to say about um, just COVID kind of was the what started the ball rolling for me and my husband leaving the church. Mm. And yeah, it's been hard for me leaving, but uh, he actually left the FLDS church and joined the LDS church for me. So it's not been as hard for him to leave because he kind of joined for me anyway. But anyway, COVID was a blessing in a way. I mean, I shouldn't say that because it's a serious disease and people have died, but you know what I mean? Like COVID church was a blessing because we got used to not going to sacrament meeting. And then when we went back, we're like, this sucks. We have to get our kids ready and have them sit still. And anyway, so that's all yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah. My exact problem too. Like I couldn't imagine having that breath of fresh air and then going back to the way it was. Yeah. It's kind of a COVID, yeah, COVID me too. That's what you're saying, Christian friend. Is and then right? you've had some good time to get a sweet tat on your arm now? Yeah, is that Oh, yeah, oh, this after. was my church on Sunday. 
Was that before? Yeah, that was, this was this uh this Sunday. It was a six hour session, but it was totally worth it. Is it more or less painful than church? <laughs> oh, um, depends on what type of pain you're talking about. If you're talking about like emotional damage, then church is definitely worse. Well, damage. I'd rather live with the tattoo pain than the mo- yeah. than emotional yeah. church. Yeah. Need to go to therapy after a tattoo session is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Christian friend. Thanks so much for joining us. We love all, all right. your comments and support. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. All right. Uh, oh wow, it looks like Bryce. Uh, <laughs> Bryce is next. Hey, Bryce. Hello, uh, John and Kara. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Where are you calling from? Okay. Uh, San Diego. Hi. I know I'm like kind of dimly lit. I'm making use of the uh, spare bedroom in the condo to it's exotic. Uh, it's exotic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's my Monstera plant. Um, the previous uh, guest you had on mentioned that she got out of church for COVID and I started raising a plant. So <laughs> good yeah. things come to us all. Um, and the wor- ward m- works in mysterious ways, right? Absolutely. Um, so but so we're running short on time. Give us a quick comment or, or I will keep it short, yeah. sweet and to the point. Yeah. Um, I was telling someone earlier that I feel like most of the folks that are currently in Mormonism either were brought in during like the wave in the seventies and eighties. Like my dad served his mission back in the eighties to the Philippines. They're either that, or they were born into it. And I feel like a lot of people are just leaving now in droves, especially because of COVID and just the cognitive dissonance of everything. So, I mean, my prediction for the future of Mormonism is it might be on its way out. I don't know. At the very least, it needs to evolve into something better, particularly so it stops going after LGBTQ folks. So, yeah. Right on. Thank you. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Bryce. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, very briefly, I love your podcast, Sean, uh, Kara, the whole team. It's amazing. I found you guys uh, however long ago. It's been the most helpful thing for me and my ex-Mormon journey and just living a happier and healthy life. So thank you so much for everything you do. I will listen as long as you keep making episodes. <laughs> nice. Oh, my goodness. That's so nice to hear. Yay. We we love to hear that. We do our best. And uh, it means so much that, that we've been useful to you. So thanks for joining yeah. us, Bryce. Thank you very much for having okay. me. Stay awesome, friends. All right. <laughs> Take care, brother. Thanks. All right. Uh, I should mention just really quickly that we do have a new, um, we have a Discord channel that um, we uh, have just started. So Discord is an important platform, just like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or all those other channels, TikTok. And uh, our good friend Justin um, is there. He leads it. and. Basically, Discord is a way for you to kind of manage your identity, but also have audio and video chats and conversations with people kind of synchronously in real time versus, um, you know, versus needing to wait like on Reddit or on Facebook for people to respond. You can have live text chats or verbal chats, and it's just a great way to provide community to people. So I just want to shout out um, to all of our amazing um friends and supporters and our new community, our new emerging community on Discord. Um, We will include a link to the Discord channel, the Mormon Stories Discord channel um, uh, in our description and in the show notes. But uh, please, please check out Discord. It's a great community and uh, we think you will love it. So shout out again to Justin and um, everyone there. All right, it's time for the rapid round. Hallie, you've been super patient. Give us a thank you so much for joining us. Give us a quick comment or or statement or whatever praise if you want. Or uh, um, well, first of all, I was getting serious uh, bearing your testimony and church vibes waiting in the waiting room. But anyways, um, <laughs> as you were going over these statistics, I just had this sinking feeling, and I was like, why am I? being sad like this is a you know this is positive. This is how you know change will happen in the church. But I think the reason that I'm so sad about this is because I'm thinking about those members who are in the church and I know that they tend to take leaving really personally. And so I just worry about how like defensive this will make the members who do choose to stay um, and like what ways the church will turn to to maintain and retain membership um, and how 
unhealthy or, you know, un, you know, defensive and poorly that could go. So just like worrying about, you know, how this will affect individuals within the church um, who choose to stay. But Yeah, that's. Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, I mean, it's sometimes we deal with our pain and our trauma by laughing or gloating or, or being cynical or critical or mocking. We don't want to be mean spirited. We need to always remember that real lives are involved, that these are real people. People cherish the church, the church impacts them. And we need to remember that there's a lot of people, 4 million, 3 million still in it that are impacted very much by these decisions. That's such a great comment. And I just want to say, like, I've been really working on trying to separate, like, the church from the people. Um, it's very hard. But whether they leave or not, like, it is unfortunate that they are in this position, because if they do leave later, they're going to have to deal with the consequences of having, you know, put the herd out there into the world that they have. And even if they don't, their relationships are not going to be the same because of the way, you know, the church affects how you treat people both in and out of the church or people who are leaving and just do all the family dynamics, all of that. And so, you know, like, this is good news, but also like, really sad news on how it affects the individual. But that's all I want to say. <laughs> so, and where are you calling us from again? I'm from West Virginia. West Virginia. Is that Hope? <laughs> no, that's Virginia. What? What is Mountaineer? You're a Mountaineer. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the, right. the funny one above Virginia. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Well, Hallie, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Thanks. Thank you all. All right. Uh, Nick, you've been patient. Give us a quick comment, Nick. Uh, thanks for joining us. Tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm from the Wasatch Front, so I'm okay, South that's Salt fine. Lake. Yeah. Uh, and just quick comment is, uh, I'm I'm not a literal believer, but I still go to church with my wife. Um, a interesting thing that comes up is the people who aren't coming to church anymore are a lot of the people with young kids. So when we look at the longevity of the LDS church, at least here in Utah. Um, it seems like a lot of those young kids aren't going to have those formative years in the church, which could lead to a quicker decline uh, than what some people might be expecting. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's a really, really good point. I'm so happy to hear that we have, you know, uh, listeners and viewers that that still attend church. And uh, would it be great also if like Orthodox true believing Mormons called into the show? Yeah, I would encourage it. Yeah, kind of want to encourage that. Um, that's a really great point, Nick. Um, uh, and, and I'm just so really, really pleased that you'd call in. Yeah. Is it is it hard navigating that mixed faith marriage? How's that going for you? Uh, yeah, the, I mean, my wife is great. She's really open to understanding. And where we've landed is just trying to be a really positive influence on the inside as much as we can be the members that uh, non-members or ex mormons would like to have dinner with kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting space, especially right now, but my wife is great, which makes it super easy. Well, uh, well, Nick, bless you and, and bless your wife. And <laughs> thank you so much for calling in. Yeah. It's so great to have you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Join thank us again. You. Okay. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, Brad, you've been patient. Uh, really quickly, welcome to uh, Mormon Scoop. Mormon hey, Scoop. how's it going, guys? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, we can. Awesome. Okay, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I know you're running late. Um, but I just, I served a mission, and it's just kind of a little frustrating to me to see how the church spends their money. Um, like, I think I had about $125 to spend a month. And there were times where me and my companion would sacrifice good food um, in order to, to survive. And it's just frustrating to see the money that the church is sitting on and spending it on temples when they could be taking care of the people who are helping grow their church. Yeah. yeah. Is, isn't that, yeah, the, I'm just saying one thing that my sister is super passionate about was nutrition on her mission. And she was felt like she was being abused and exploited. And I'm sure most missionaries know, like you sometimes go without dinner because you don't even have the money, the funds, you don't have time to grocery shop and your body, you're young and you, you can only take so much walking, so much biking and the church. It's, it is really strange to me. Like, that's a great yeah. point. There was a time where 
I didn't have any money and we went grocery shopping because my companion had money. And I remember walking in and an old lady gave me like $20 as she was leaving. But at the time I took that as a miracle, but now realizing that was a nice lady. So that was <laughs> definitely life-saving for me, but I don't know. Yeah. It's just frustrating. You know, that's like $4 a day to spend. Um, and it's just like, we're trying to help grow the church, but that's not working if we yeah. can. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing that they do. Yeah, you'd think with all of that money that they'd be investing in the health and well-being of their missionaries a little bit more. And safety, right? And safety. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and what a brilliant, uh, you know, business model where you make your salespeople pay, pay to the <laughs> salespeople. Yeah, and then hold back that money to give in <laughs> little yeah. allowances, so... And we, we've had many, many, many people write into Mormon stories and talk about like, you know, being assaulted on their missions, like having being being raped. You know, we actually had uh, two sister missionaries talk about literally being raped on their missions. Um, and they were intentionally put in areas that the church knew were gang gang infested, like the Mexican church cartel areas yeah. that they took them out of and then put them back in just because I guess that's where the converts will come. Yeah. yeah. The very porous, yeah. Not know, thinking about the areas. best safety of what's best for the missionaries yeah. as, as individuals. Yeah. Such yeah. a great point, Brad. Thank you so much for joining us. Where, yeah. Do you want to tell us where you're calling from or? Uh, yeah, I'm from Riverton, Utah, which you also oh. name dropped in the show. So <laughs> is it pretty Mormon? So, so it's basically Spanish fork. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, it's interesting. Like there's people here who, have stopped coming to church for those reasons with COVID and stuff. So I can testify that the stuff you guys were showing was true. All right. So uh, boots on the ground, confirming a little mm -hmm. bit of what we're saying. Yeah. That's why these Collins are amazing. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining us, Brad. Thanks for having me. Stay good. Thank you. All right. Megan, you've been patient. Welcome to. Uh, Welcome to Mormon <laughs> Scoops with John and Kara. <laughs> Hi, I just, uh, I wanted to comment on the discourse around people being like upset or belittling changes that the church does make. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely an advocate for those changes, but the more time that passes to me, it feels like the church is just trying to keep their head above water and changing enough to try and keep like the liberal members, but not changing enough to lose conservative members, if that makes sense. So it's like they're playing this game, balancing like, okay, what changes can we make without losing this group? What changes do we have to make to keep this group? And it just makes it all feel very disingenuous. Um, hi, Gerardo. <laughs> Gerardo was my TA at BYU Idaho, by the way. Um, but yeah, so I think that a lot of the times the people that get upset about the changes is because it feels a little, it's too little too late, or the church takes one step forwards and two steps back. Um, and I mean, I served a mission, I graduated from BYU-Idaho, I am queer, and I've left the church. So this stuff affects me really directly, but I mean, it's like the honor code, reversal, uh, change and reversal and you have a uh, Holland musket fire talk and then the church changes the handbook to allow gender affirming treatments and stuff and then the news comes out last week that the language center at BYU is now enforcing trans exclusionary policies and so it's just this back and forth and I mean I know BYU and the church are not synonymous but um, you get the point so it's just really hard to be happy when someone goes to like goes from actively trying to take your rights to like tolerating your existence, that's like a really hard change to celebrate. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really, it's a really good point. Uh, we're so happy that you joined us, Megan. And uh, it is, it is really hard to celebrate what one episode care we really need to do. The church puts out these marketing, you know, sort of customer satisfaction, membership surveys probably on a quarterly basis where mm -hmm. they're like what podcast do you listen to how often do you pray how often do you read your scriptures if we were to change our lgbtq policies would you stay or leave if we were to give women the priesthood would you stay or leave and it's such a bizarre practice to sort of govern sort of prophes pro prophecy via customer research survey you know yeah. methods just like, like a regular corporation <laughs> 
Hmm. Yeah, it feels like it feels like a business, to be honest. And that's why I say, you know, the church could the church could allow gay marriage and I would not go back because it just feels like they're doing it as a manipulation control tactic. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, Megan, you're delightful. We need to meet you. (laughs) Where did you tell us where you're calling from? Or do you want to I'm going I'm calling from Arizona? I just moved here from daybreak. Um, so all right. Well, how, how, how hot is it in Arizona? It's really lovely. 70 degrees. Oh, rub it in, <laughs> rub it in, Megan, rub it in. How beige is it? That's my biggest complaint about Arizona. <laughs> beige. <laughs> it's pretty beige. There's a few sorrows, but <laughs> yeah, enjoying- I'd love to, I would love to meet you guys. Are you joining it more than, more than Utah? Are you enjoying Arizona more than Utah? Yeah. You know, it's been surprising actually to step away from the culture. I didn't really realize how much it was affecting me being in Utah um, and it being such an active part of my life. Obviously here I am watching Mormon stories, but um, it's been interesting to see how much less of a prominent part my religious trauma plays in my day-to-day life yeah. being out of Utah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're finding healing and growth. We ought to do a Thrive Arizona and come out and, and visit you. You can, you can be a speaker, Megan. How does that sound? <laughs> I don't know about that, but I will be in Utah in a few weeks. So well, let's party. Let's let's go to lunch with Gerardo. Yeah. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> All right, Megan, you're the best. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Stay in touch, okay? All right. All right. Elizabeth, you've been oh no, Elizabeth. Sorry. Elizabeth, you've been patient. Welcome to oh welcome to Mormon Scoop with <laughs> John and Gara. You've got a good DJ voice. Thank you. Did you ever want to be a DJ? I am right now. Are you saying I'm not? Oh, you are. You're a you're DJ newscaster. Sorry, Elizabeth, you've been patient. Uh, welcome. Oh, and we can't hear you and your mic's unmuted. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure why. No, uh, sorry, it's not working. It may be that you didn't enable your microphone when you joined. Join. Try joining us again. Maybe come back in. I'll kick you from the studio and you can uh, try and come back in and re-enable. Okay, we just have time for just a couple more super quick ones. We've got Alana. Hey, Alana. Oh, unmute. We, oh, unmute. Sorry. All right, got it. Hey, hey Alana. Guys. Where are you joining us from? I'm from Scotland. Oh, Alana, what a treat. <laughs> it's me. Um, yeah, super late here. It's half past four in the morning. Um, I don't. What are you doing well. up? What are you doing <laughs> up? Oh, I didn't want to miss this episode. I, I should really be sleeping, but. Um, yeah, well, you're just, not on 21st just, Century Saints, are you? I am. Um, Okay, that you're you're an important force in in the world of Mormonism and post Mormonism, and in the British invasion, the Brit Vengers, as we like to say. You have an important YouTube channel and podcast called Twenty First Century Saints. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We oh, have royalty. No we have post Mormon British royalty. Scott, <laughs> Scottish. I would go that far. <laughs> I would. Okay. Um, I just I was thinking a lot about you know when they're talking about the numbers and I was thinking you know just based on something that one of my family members had said at one time that the church is growing and I just think why do the church portray that I can't really speak to the last couple of years because obviously I've not been attending church or general conference or anything um but like I just think why do they want people to believe that they're growing when really they're not um I mean my ward alone um before I left, just before COVID, the numbers were really dwindling. You know, fam- families were leaving, a lot of them being my family. Um, and I just think, you know, it's they've actually recently brought in, I mean, I, I can't be 100% sure on all the numbers, but maybe about 30 folk into our ward just to try and build up. And it seems to be a lot of young people that they're bringing in um, to try and build the ward up, you know, and, and I think here in the UK. So it was just interesting to see, you know, the numbers in in America as well to hear that just because obviously we can see a real big decline here in the UK. Yeah. I've heard uh, you tell me if that's right, Alana, but I've heard that the, that in Scotland, the church is not just imploding. It's, it's in steep decline. So it's not just no longer growing. It's not just flatlining. We're talking about wards and stakes being collapsed. uh, Yeah. Well, I recently went to state conference and like, I was quite surprised to see the lack of people who were actually there compared to the last time that I attended. Um, It it was crazy. There was very little uh, people there. I mean, probably a lot of people were watching on Zoom due to COVID and things, but 
it was still interesting to see the, the lack of people there in comparison to normal. Yeah. Um, Why was you telling Kara offline how freaking amazing it is to have someone from Scotland <laughs> joining us on this It took this me all my time. Yeah. Like, I waited forever to actually click join because although I do the podcast, this makes me so nervous being on the John Dillon show. <laughs> Kara Burrell show. How about uh, the Cara Burrell, Burrell yeah, show? Yeah, is amazing. No. no. Amazing. We love Kara. Yeah. Kara. <laughs> so so, so if you had to give a thumbs up or thumbs down to Kara. What's, what's that? I said we were hoping Kara would maybe come on our show. <laughs> Freaking go twenty four seven. What's the heck? I have this problem when people have like any kind of really awesome UK accent. All I want to do is just listen to you. So you'd ask me a question, and I'd just be like lost in your voice. Like, did you say That's something? That's how we felt when we had John in the podcast. I'm like, I can't do this because it's John freaking the Can I just, just say it. quickly one more thing? I know yeah. you guys are hurry. I just wanted to shout out to Sam Young. Um, you know, in relation to everything he did, that was actually a big part in my faith crisis when all that came out. Um being a survivor that you know I've, I've hoped for these changes to happen in the church for a long time but what really annoys me is why does it take for a man who is only trying to fight for good to be excommunicated and then years later they're suddenly saying oh we've got some changes like I can't understand why they do that why could they not have just fixed it when Sam was advocating for for that change I, I can't I can't understand why they do that it is the strangest pattern Everything has to come, like we were saying earlier, from agitators and then covering up why that they changed just to have this cloak of revelation. But don't let the members know that it was yeah. actually the people yeah, that were that, that, that were actually trying to discount and discredit and excommunicate. It's the pattern since the beginning of the church, since Joseph Smith. And it's so wild that members, I just sometimes they have complete blinders on. And it's not until we just start talking about it, putting it in the news, making podcasts about it, that we get members' attention saying like, we want Mormonism to be healthier. We want your kids to be safe. Do you want them? Sam wants it. Apparently yeah. the only person dragging their feet is, is the church until they're forced into a corner to do it. Yeah. When you agree, John, that's just like the oh, pattern of the church since that since yeah. it was founded. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Strange. Very strange. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate hey, you listen, guys and everything you do. We're doing a Thrive UK in May. Uh Clint and Jenny and I are coming out to the UK. I really hope you can join us, Alana. It would be so fun. I'm working on it. It's my little one's birthday on the 23rd. So uh, it's her little I'm one's birthday on work it out to go. So. well, I hope to see as many of our UK friends and and listeners as possible. We're not yeah. coming to do anything other than support community in yeah. the UK. That's the for only sure. reason we're coming. I hope to see you. Thanks yep. for all you're doing. And, and in the show Thank notes, you. can we do 21st century saints in the show notes? Sure. Check out their podcast. It's great. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks Alana. Bye. Take care. So great to have you. All right. We got to add Ruben because Ruben, Ruben represents our Latino contingency. Ruben. And our fabulous community. And our fabulous contingency. And uh, Hi. fellow TikToker. And Ruben, I've seen you call for more Latino voices on Mormon Stories. And I think that's a legitimate thing. We're trying, but we always want more. So oh, Ruben, I know. I know. We're so happy that you joined us. Yeah. How are you? So I, I really liked um, the show. Um Especially, I really like the fact that about Elder Bednar um, now incorporating the actual temple ceremony and the actual temple prep. Because when I took temple prep like 20 years ago, back in 2002, I was only taught like just general uh, atonement stuff and, and symbolism. But when I did the ceremony, I was like, this is weird. But you know, I, I had a, I, I still had a positive temple experience, but it was weird, you know. And so I'm kind of glad that Bednar's doing this, that they're actually going to know what's going to happen in the temple, you know. Uh, so that that's one thing that really caught my attention during this uh, broadcast. Yeah, informed consent. It's so important, right, Ruben? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Ruben, what's your TikTok channel so that those who want to follow you can? It's Ruben underscore happy because I like to be happy. Yeah, you're the best, Ruben. You're such a cutie. And we're gonna we're working on a potential Mormon stories Espanol. And so we I, we've heard your Espanol feedback. Espanol or or you need to interview me first. Okay, we'll work on that. Yeah. I'll work on that. Oh, we'll work on that. I already done interviews in Spanish with other people. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, will you we're, we're, sing a couple bars for us? 
Blue sky smiling at me. Nothing but blue blue skies do I see. Yes, I kind of wish I was doing karaoke. I miss karaoke. (laughs) What's up, John? Yeah. Yeah, we need karaoke with with Ruben. Ruben, Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Ruben, you just won your way on Marma Stories. Let's get that on the calendar. All right. Take all right, care. love you, brother. Thanks for all your good yeah, work. You too. All right, uh, stay Bye. in touch. All right, we got we got to go to Estonia. Like we've we've got Scotland, we've got Latino America represented, and now we have freaking Roger from Estonia, Eastern Europe. What's up, Roger? What's up? That's a nickname to to be exact, though. Okay, so you're from- nice nice to meet you, Doctor Dylan and Kara. Are, are you Estonian? Um, close. A Finno-Ugric heritage is in my okay. blood, but it's it gets a little complicated. All right. And, well, we're um, glad to have you. We're glad. To and have I you. did watch the 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 show you had with the Ukrainian lady, a convert from Ukraine. Yeah, she's and, great. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, I'm a never Mormon. Oh. Who, who got badly damaged by the church? Oh no. And it's still ongoing. My children are been sold by a Mormon judge in Utah, hmm. essentially to to the church. So I am right now dealing with some really heavy stuff, but um, sorry, Roger. Yeah. That's perhaps for a different time. I just wanted to share an analogy about what's happening with the, um, with the church as observed by, well, a foreigner, but now I believe I know more than a true believing Mormon about the church and the history and problems and whatnot. So, but the analogy is um, the movie Titanic. And it's befitting because the acronym of TSCC, the so-called church, is thrown around. So uh, we can say RMS Titanic has met its iceberg already, and it's taking on water really fast. Yet the brethren are busy rearranging deck chairs. Mm. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I love it. Rearranging deck chairs and like perfect analogy would be like changing the logo and like don't say Mormon. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, the ship's going yeah. down, bros. It's basically, going down. basically, basically, some minor changes that appear not to address cosmetic. Yeah, they're cosmetic, and and from everything that I've been uh, discussing on Reddit and other sources, you know, Nemo the Mormon and all the wonderful YouTubers that are doing a fantastic work and, you know, websites with resources, widow's might and all kinds of things. I mean, I, I haven't, and you were referring to the surveys and the research that the church does. And in Utah, I'm a, I'm a data analyst professional. So, uh, uh, jobs related to data analytics in, in, in the Zion, most likely, uh, a lot of people go through uh, what is it family search it's it's so basically the church has plenty of data analytics that they can do and it seems that they are collecting data they can identify they've got the tools they can identify and they can figure out what to address and so cosmetics could be the word rearranging deck chairs could be a word it it just yeah you mentioned the temples right it just doesn't make sense so the thinking just doesn't add up and the show you had about the ensign peak advisors and the suggestion i forget the gentleman uh, who was on the show but the suggestion that the directors the top brass at the um, at ensign peak they're compensated way more than the first presidency and the q15 and, and and so forth I mean, we're talking millions for, for the expertise of those people to manage the funds. And the suggestion is that, well, is the brethren really making the decisions? Or, I mean, what is the dynamic there? And so once you start thinking about that, it doesn't make sense even more. It's It, it becomes even harder. Right. Wow. Wow. You know more about Mormonism than most ex-Mormons, which is saying a lot. It's a good analysis, right? Well, so. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that because I've learned from I, I got to give credit to all of you guys and the, the beautiful Redditors on on ex-Mormon. And you know what? The 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 Reddit ex-Mormons gave me appreciation for Gen Z's. I don't know, Kara, where you fit on the generation scale, but 
I have a lot of respect for Gen Zs these days. They're they're truly technology natives, according to a researcher from Nielsen's ratings that I saw a presentation about neuromarketing uh, from the University of California system. There is some really good insight into what digital natives are able to do and how they uh, consume information and how they um, share information and, and and so forth. Yeah. Right. Right on. I am a millennial, but I speak Gen Z and to the Gen Z kids, you saw some things that were troubling on like the gospel topics essays. You realized it was sus and you came to Mormon stories to spill the tea and, <laughs> and yeah. another, another word. I'm, I'm, I'm Gen X. I'm, I'm Gen X and not, and not even a tail end. I'm, I'm Gen X. Well, Roger, I, I'm going to extend you an invitation to come on Mormon Stories because I want to interview some never Mormons about why they care about Mormonism so much. So yeah. if it ever works out for you to come on, we'd love to have you. Oh, oh, think- we, we can we can make it happen. I've got quite the story. Nine years, well, more than nine years and counting. All right, Roger, thanks for joining and would us. Would you be impressed if I know exactly where Estonia is? Uh, tell me the capital. I don't know. I didn't say the capital. All I said is that I memorized it and I... Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. What, what, what's the country to the north of Estonia? Uh, I'm not that's not important. You. All I know is it goes to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The answer is, the answer is Tallinn. Tallinn is the capital, says Google. Is that cheating? Uh, Tallinn. <laughs> Tallinn. Oh, say it again. Tallinn. Okay. Tallinn. Like Italian. Tallinn. And 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 the and the name uh, the the city the capital city changed its name throughout history. But in 1219, um, it was uh, Estonia was pagan. And 1219, the Crusaders, the Vikings from Denmark, uh, conquered Estonia, and they got their flag at that battle. And that's the oldest flag, if not in the world, but in Europe, because they started to use it as a battle flag. You know, the white, oh, wow. uh, the, the red, the red banner with the red cross on it, because it fell from the sky as Danes were losing. And they saw it as a sign from God, and they charged ahead, and they won the battle. There's a there's a very um, uh, very small, um, not even a monument, like a plaque in Tallinn to commemorate that. And Tallinn is <laughs> is believed to mean Danish town. Well, Roger, we were Cassandra is saying get get Roger on Mormon stories as soon as possible. So Roger that. <laughs> Roger yeah, that. Too much. Roger that. All right. Thanks for joining us, Roger. We really want to have you my, back. My, my, my pleasure. I'm, I'm yeah. glad to finally talk to you. Good luck bring, with all bring, the I, I hope John Larson is settling in. And uh, Larson, he's coming soon. He's coming yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. He's almost got his equipment set up. We bought him a whole bunch of new equipment. He's getting it set up, and he'll be joining us soon. So, All right, Roger. Stay in touch. Thanks so much. All right. We really need to close. We're going to take three more, and that's it. Uh, make them super quick. John Sawyer, give us a quick comment. Uh, oh, you're, oh, sorry. Let unmute. me unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Hey, Karen, John. Um, just wanted to say the church may be on decline, but its bank account is not, I don't think. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, um, I converted to the church at a very young age. And to extend the Titanic analogy, um, it was a life raft to me at age 15, mm-hmm. having been raised in hellfire and brimstone, extremely um, anti-homophobic Pentecostalism. And the church... Um, was a needed community for my time or for at, for me at that time in my life. Um, and so I want to see the church address its homophobic past, its racism, its patriarchy, and acknowledge that there are so many wonderful people in it and can still be in it. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Beautiful, John. Yes. Where are you calling us from? If you uh, want Boulder, to Boulder, Colorado. Colorado represent. Go Buffaloes. Yeah. Go Buffaloes. All right. Thanks. All right, John. Cool. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, man. Stay in touch. Um, all right. Uh, Jennifer, you've been patient. Give us a quick uh, parting parting thought or comment. I'll unmute you really quickly. Uh, yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, so part of the millennials who are leaving to protect my children, I have a eight-year-old trans daughter who she's not allowed to go to the bathroom in the building. And I don't want to have her ha- in her life think that that's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, our our heart goes out to your daughter. Tab. And also, my wife is trans too, and that's you know, it's 
that's not something I'm okay with anymore. Had to move to Utah to find out that we completely broke our faith. <laughs> we moved in September and then by October, both me and my wife, um, our shells broke. I am so, so sorry. Trans lives matter. Yes. They do. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Our heart goes out to all your family, but your daughter and your, and your wife. And, uh, we, we, you know, the church has harmed a lot of people. The way the church is dealing with with gender, with transgender individuals. Yeah, is- my my wife actually, um, she came out ten years after we were married. It took her a really long time, and she actually grew up with scrupulosity because she was raised in a super orthodox home as a trans woman, and they didn't know that. And they, like my daughter my trans daughter when she was young and I would let her wear her sister's clothes, my mother-in-law would be so upset. And I'd be like, if she wants to do that, that that's her prerogative. It doesn't matter if she goes up to be trans. That's if that's who she's going to be. And yeah, that's amazing that you have that kind of perspective, even as a, as a believing Mormon. Yes. I was raised Mormon and my wife was raised Mormon. I was raised um, not as Orthodox, and I was very progressive growing up, but through high school, like I wouldn't date seriously any boys that weren't Mormon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Jennifer. Well, we're so glad you called and to help kind of remind us. And of- my wife is actually um, on the board of the trans, trans non-gender, um, TN, gender, network on Facebook. She's one of the moderators and admin and um, grew up um, Orthodox. And now she runs that network with help from others and helping to bring trans awareness to everyone. Allies are allowed to be on there and people who want to bring happiness to those that are going through that. So good. Love to you and your family. Yeah. Just congratulations on being able to be Mormon and support your daughter and your wife and all of the, I'm sure, yeah. you know, probably very insensitive and rude comments that you have to field and protect them from. So my heart goes Not as much as we were expecting, but yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for joining us. All right. We've got some really important final announcements to make, but before we do that. Elizabeth, we're going to give you one more shot. Unmute and see if uh, if we can hear you. Oh, no, we can't hear you, Elizabeth. I'm so sorry. It's, thank you for trying, Elizabeth. Just pantomime. Was it a we'll, good episode? We'll try you next time. Give us a thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up. We got the thumbs up. All right. Sorry, Elizabeth. You next, have a lovely smile. I we'll, like your haircut. We'll try again next time. It's it's great <gasps> to see Kermit you. Does it come the frog in the background? Oh, oh Kermit it. the frog. We love Kermit the frog. I love it. (laughs) I'm feeling a rainbow connection right now. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. (laughs) This is my favorite call of the day. We love you. We love you, Elizabeth. All right. Take care. We'll see you soon. All right, Kara. Well, this has been amazing. This has been so good. Yeah. (gasps) We still have 1,500 people uh, joining us. We do have some really important announcements. We're going to say bye to Kara and bring on um, Jen Camp. But, But do you want to say goodbye before you bail? Um, Anything you I, want to say? I'm just really proud of everyone who's taken the time to tune in and hope that we can do this every single week. So everyone just keep the super chats coming. Please keep donating to Mom stories so I can keep having this job because it's a dream come true to be able to work with amazing people. You're going to meet Jen right now. And dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Jen camp. And we're going to do, we're going to do Mormon scoops either Tuesday nights or Thursday nights around 7 p.m. Mountain Time every week, if we can keep it up. Is that right? Yeah. And we have like interviews back to back to back this week. We have interviews tomorrow, Thursday, Friday. So we're just like keeping the content pumped out here. So you don't need to worry. You're going to get all the same like long format content, interviews, scholars, everything. We're just diversifying the portfolio of Mormon Stories content. So thank you, everyone. I love you guys so much. And Carrie, you've been a freaking blessing to Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. We adore you. Thank you so much for all you do. All right. I'm going to moonwalk out of here. All right, Kara. Thanks so much, everyone. And without uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce to you the newest uh, member of the Open Stories Foundation staff, 
Jen Camp. Hey, Jen. Hi. How's it going? Oh, hey. I got to get used to this. How does it feel to like go from like <laughs> being an active faithful Mormon and then like in a year or two joining Voldemort's crew? Like, is that scary? Is it weird? What's that like? It, it's a little weird. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's a little weird. But um, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Oh, is your countenance darkened since you've joined the Open Stories Foundation? Has the light, has the light, got, the spirit gone out of your eyes? Yeah, that's that's a touchy, touchy thing on my heart right now. <laughs> but no, I am much more happy, connected to myself, and um, in a really good space. All right. Yeah. Well, we're so thrilled you've joined us, uh, Jen. We brought you on to help with kind of office management, project management. Um, basically so much that's needed to kind of take stuff off my plate so that I can do more of content and strategy and, and that sort of thing. And you've come on to help us with the events, but we have a few really important announcements that you've been really uh, leading, leading us on. And so I think I want to just uh, have us talk about a few. So the first thing I'll, I'll set this up and then you can tell us more details, but I'm just so tired of people coming to me at retreats and workshops saying, I live in Alpine, I live in Highland, and I don't know any ex-Mormons. And we know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of ex-Mormons and post-Mormons in Alpine, Lehigh, Highland, uh, you know, sort of area. And we also know that this Alpine, um, you know, sort of a fireside that Brad Wilcox did has set Alpine ablaze in terms of people frustrated with and or, you know, wanting to leave the church. And so we've got a couple Alpine events that are scheduled. Do you want to, want to talk about those really quick and what they are and why we're doing them? Sure. Yeah. First um, um, up is the Thrive event we're going to have in Alpine. It's just a meetup. It's just um, for community. We're just going to have a potluck. Um, John's going to say a few words and we're just going to meet each other and um, get to know each other. That is going to be held at the Knot and Pine um, Event Center. So um, shout out to them, they're amazing. And um, just come, Just um, there's a link on mormonstories.org. If you click on the events tab, all of these things we're talking about today will be under the events tab. And you've got a QR code there right yeah. in the bottom of the screen. They can, and if they scan that QR code, what's it gonna take them to? It's going to take them to a form that we're going to have you fill out um, your information so we can contact you um, with the information about the event. Um, so it'll just ask a few questions, and that's how you sign up for that event. And we'll keep that information confidential. Yes. And if that weren't enough for Alpine, <laughs> there's more. What else do we got? What else we got going on in Alpine? Um, so the amazing John and Margie Dillon are going to do a one-day workshop in the Alpine area, um, also at um, Knot and Pine. And um, that Sunday, March 20th, um, it's just a day event. Um, it's kind of a more intimate setting for um, people going through a faith crisis. I went to one myself um, um, about nine months ago or so, where I first met John and Kara. And um, it was very instrumental in helping me heal in my poor, my post Mormon um, faith transition transition journey, and um, which kind of um, is in my heart. That's why I'm working with the Mormon Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation to bring more events, more community. Um, I'm hoping to put together more in-person things um, for the post-Mormon community. I love it. Yeah. And you, your work has been so important, Jen. And yeah, the Alpine meetup is more kind of Thrive sponsored. It's literally just to help people in Alpine, Highland, maybe Lehigh, depending on how many, and, and also Cedar Hills. Is that right? Like yeah, helping mm -hmm. people in that general area find friends. It's free. Anyone mm -hmm. can come kind of like a potluck. That's different. The, the workshop, there is a fee to pay for um, expenses uh, for the full day experience mm -hmm. to pay for Jen. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we're able to afford Jen and uh, and support her work. And so there is a, a what I think is a very reasonable uh, admission fee for the all day workshop. That's separate deal from the free Thrive based Alpine meetup. Correct. Okay. Yes. 
All right. So that's kind of the Alpine rescue, so to speak, the Alpine post-Mormon rescue. We also have a really exciting thing to announce mm -hmm. around the Open Stories Foundation offering free or pay whatever you can afford uh, faith crisis support groups. And this is a really big deal. Do you want to tell us what this is about? Um. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm yeah, I super guess I did. <laughs> I'm I'm super excited about this. Um they um we've put together support groups along um the Wasatch Front and also in St. George um and online. And these support groups will meet once a week. Um they are free. You can also um I mean, donate. I think we're saying like minimum. Well, I, I guess anyone can come. Right. Yeah. Anyone. Anyone mm -hmm. can come if you can't pay and then go ahead. Yeah. If you can't pay, we also have the QR code on the flyers. Um, if you would like to make a donation um, each week when you come or if someone just listening to this wants to make a donation towards um, keeping these support groups going, they're welcome to do that also. Yeah. And so where I guess we should list all the yeah. different ones that are happening. So starting most north. Bountiful. So we have one in Bountiful. Okay. That's Gabby Accord. Mm -hmm. She is amazing. One. Heart to Gabby. Love her. Okay. Um, Michelle Peets is in Holiday area. So there's a holiday group. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And again, this, this QR code works for all the different sites. And I guess we're starting in just a, in just a week. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rush. So yep. if you want to join these <laughs> groups, please uh, join them soon. Um, okay, going south. Um, Lehigh American Fork area with Mark Osland. The and Mark Osland he from is Podcast. amazing. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then we're moving on to Provo with Allison Schiffler, which she's amazing too. I just can't say enough about these people leading these groups. They are just so, so amazing. And their heart is in it. And I love them all. And then we go down to St. George. St. George. So we do have a group for you in Southern, Southern Utah. St. George with Corey Reese. Yeah. And then we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to do an online group. Yeah. And I'm going to be uh, hosting that faith crisis support group. We hope to do it once a week. We're going to pick the date and the time. And here's the catch. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of a catch, Jen. And Just the catch is we're going to be making this support group public. So. We want to provide you with this free support, but we want to do one version of a support group, full eight sessions that is just free to the public. So we need people who are interested in the online free support group um, or pay whatever you want to realize that if you join my um, Mormon Faith Crisis Online Support Group, you have to be okay with it being recorded and shared with the world. And so obviously there's going to be some people that don't want to join that because of yeah. privacy or confidentiality reasons, but hopefully there's going to be enough people that are able and willing to be open about what they're experiencing that we can fill the group and, uh, right. and kind of, and all uh, the other groups are private. If you'd rather have a private experience. Yeah. And of course, if, if other, if there's other geographical areas that want support groups in the future, mm -hmm. if this, if this uh, experiment goes off well, and if we can get enough. So again, it's free if you don't have any money. We're requesting like a $10 a week or 20 or $30 a week donation if you can afford it. And literally the only reason we are requesting donations for those who can afford it is to pay for the therapist because we're paying all these therapists out of our own budget. And we're paying Jen mm -hmm. to organize all this. And we just want these programs to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. This is not done with any intent of making money through the open stories foundation, we're almost certainly going to be losing money on this, but it's a, it's a, we, we've had a great year. We've got some extra funds. And so we want to use those funds to promote healing and growth mm -hmm. in the post Mormon community. So people use these events. These are free support groups, St. George, Provo, Lehigh American Fork, Bountiful holiday and online. If, uh, if you want. And if that weren't enough, there's one more exciting announcement to make. Um, many of you have heard of Dr. Julie Hanks. 
Uh, she uh, is Lex de Azevedo's daughter, although she would probably be mad that I introduced her that way. She is a singer. She's a songwriter. She is a um, PhD level psychologist, psychotherapist, and she leads Wasatch Mental Health, which is its own therapy practice here on the Wasatch Front. And she's just an amazing human. And she's active and faithful Mormon. Mm -hmm. Her husband's a bishop and she is active in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is such a powerful voice. And I've held two mixed faith marriage retreats with her in the past. And she has been willing now to team with me for a third mixed faith. Did I say mixed orientation? Mixed faith mixed marriage faith. event where she is going to partner with me. It's a two and a half day retreat. And we're asking for mixed faith marriages who need support to join. This is going to be July 15th through 17th, 2022. It's going to be in Provo at the Thrive Center. And we are going to be talking about all of the issues that are important to mixed faith marriages. And the only requirement for coming is that you can um, pay the registration fee um, and you're in a mixed faith marriage. And if that weren't cool enough, we have a cool donor yes. who has donated $5,000 mm -hmm. of scholarships. We want people to at least pay some of their way. So it's going to be sort of like pay what you can uh, so that we can support, pay Julie, um, pay for the event, pay for, pay for Jen, but also we'll be offering some scholarships so mm -hmm. that um, young or financially struggling Mormon mixed faith marriages aren't excluded from this event. Right. Thank yeah. you so much donors for helping with that and allowing um, these mixed faith um, marriages to um, be able to come to the retreat with Julie. I'm really looking forward to that. She's amazing. Yeah. So please spread the word about this and all the events. If you've got loved ones, friends, family, community members that uh, need support, that are going through a faith crisis, that are in a mixed faith marriage, please let people know about all these support groups and about the mixed faith marriage retreat. Yeah. I was in a mixed faith marriage for about four years, and this would have been very beneficial. So I'm yeah. excited for this. Well, Jen, it's so <laughs> lovely to have you uh, on the Open Source Foundation team. Thanks for all your Thank hard work. You. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Um, you know, uh, Kara's coming back. We love you guys. Please uh, support us if you appreciate this content, if you value this content, if you want to see it continue. We need your support. We've got our best year ever, but um, we, we're trying to expand our services. Come on in here, Kara. Get in here. Stay in here, Jen. Um, we are expanding our services. I don't, you know, if more money comes into the Open Stories Foundation, it does not go to John. It, uh, We are trying to use our resources to expand our services. So uh, that's Kara, that's Gerardo, that's Jen, that's Jennifer, um, and uh, so many other <laughs> things we'll be doing with your support. And so if you want to uh, help us reach and help more people, please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. Um, and we'll be able to just help so many more people and uh, promote healing and growth and community for people in transition. Yeah? Yeah. Kara, well, Jen, you guys are awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> Thank you guys. And uh, we're going to do, be doing more Mormon scoops in the weeks, months, and years ahead. And, you know, do not worry. We have so much long-form, traditional Mormon stories content on the horizon, including the Rodney Meldrum on Friday. But we've got some cool things before then as well. So. Yeah, but they're not live. You have questions for Rod Meldrum on Friday, Heartland Model, Young Earth, Creation, Universal Model, all of the things that have to do with what my parents love and hate about me not accepting. Uh, ask, uh, tell us what you want in the show notes or what, sorry, what's the word in the um, description? The description or in the comments? In the comments, in the comments <laughs> on, on Facebook yes. or Instagram mm -hmm. or whatever. All right. We love you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Bye, everybody. Take care.